holy crap. People persist in doubting the evidence. Don't run and hide. Don't be afraid. Don't turn away any longer. The truth will set you free. You're listening to Jimmy Church Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. We're turning all of our incentives towards Jimmy Church on Dark Matter Radio. <laughs> and now, your host, the captain of conspiracy, the prince of paranormal. This ain't your daddy's radio network show. This is Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Hey now. How you doing, everybody? How you doing? Let's get this one cracking. We got a big one tonight. And don't you want to know? You got to wait. You got to wait. <laughs> This is Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. Today's Tuesday, September 9th, 251 days into the new year. Live from the JP Motorsports Studios, right here, sunny Gates of Hell, Burbank, California, for KJCR and the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your humble host, Jimmy Church. Oh, yeah. Big salute to the proud men and women in uniform. Shot of Starbucks right now for him. Watch this. Mm. It's courtesy of Rick and his family. Anniversary blend. That's what I'm talking about. Because without those proud men and women laying it out every day, protecting that constitution of ours, there would be no me, no you, and no tweet deck. And what kind of world would that be? It would be North Korea. That's what it would be. Let's get this one cracking. Oh, my, my. Oh, my, my. See, I know. See, I know. I know what's going on tonight. And you don't. (laughs) That ain't right, is it? I knew it would come to this one day, right? But we were in this kind of position, you know, to, to potentially lay down some radio history. I knew there would come a day, and it's here. <laughs> I'm giddy, I'm like a little kid. Today, check this out. Let's get this one cracking for real. Today, our very own Dale Romero is 29 years old 29 years old everybody in twitter right now hashtag j church radio no uh, at j church radio hashtag dm radio net say happy birthday to dale light it up light it up because he's here tonight (laughs) he played hooky last night i don't know where he was 29 years old. And this is the thing. I've known Dale for 30 years. I don't know. Who is who is really? Who is John Teeter? <laughs> it's Dale. Happy birthday, my brother. I I can't say uh I can't say more than that. My brother and friends for so so long. Happy birthday. And I can't wait till next year when we do it right here. Happy birthday. 
All right. Our dead guy birthday today, almost as big as Dale, Otis Redding. Born in 1941, died in 1967 at the age of 26. After appearing at the 1967 Monterey Pop Festival, Redding, up there in San Francisco, was inspired to write the song Dock of the Bay with Steve Cropper. Steve Cropper, you may remember, was the guitar player in the Blues Brothers band, the guy with the long beard playing the telly. Also with Donald Duck Dunn, he was the bass player in the Blues Brothers. Steve Cropper and Donald Duck Dunn were staff guys, producers and writers, musicians at Stax Records in Memphis. And the story goes as this. Otis writes the song, comes back to Memphis. They record it. Booker T and the MGs, you know, that was the Stax band. Donald Duck, Donald Duck Dunn, Steve Cropper. And Steve produced all, all that stuff for everybody back there in Memphis at, at, at Stax Records. So he's mixing the song. Otis comes into town, a couple of overdubs, walks out the door as Steve is mixing the track for sitting on the dock of the bay. He's mixing and literally turns around over his shoulder and says, see you to Otis. Otis says, man, you know, song sounds good. See you when I get back. And that was the last time the two saw each other. He, he passed away playing crash after playing a couple of concerts and, and died. And Steve Cropper had to sit and mix that song knowing that his best friend died. And that song went on not only to become number one for a long time, but it was the first song to go number one posthumous. That's right. Otis Redding, 26 years old. The next time you hear Doc of the Bay, you think about that story I just told you. That's how it went down. Crazy. Crazy story. Happy birthday, Otis. Absolutely. Now, on that note, <laughs> it's actually a good story, I guess. But it's a mysterious story. It's a strange story. Follow us on Twitter tonight, at J Church Radio. You can hear my voice. That's what you want to do. Over, uh, I, I want to say this really quick. Over at Dark Matter, uh, the new website that they've got up over there, much improved layout, much improved. And now when you go straight to the Dark Matter page, the players there, the audio kicks in automatically. You have the uh, uh, show schedule over on the right. Um, you're able to click on everything right there. You go over to the uh, Fade to Black page. All of that is cleaned up, and the entire website is is so much nicer. Um <laughs> It just makes the makes life easy. And today I just found myself uh, at the studio sitting there in dark matter, just just letting it roll and listening to uh, the other programming. Pretty good stuff and uh, good job. So if you're over on the dark matter page right now, if you're on fade to black, uh, you can go and follow us. All the links are there. The call in numbers are there just like before, but it's easier. It's better. And uh, it, it, it's uh how do I want to say it? It's as it's aesthetically pleasing to the eyes. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. Facebook is JimmyChurchRadio.com. That's the fan page. You can go over to my personal page if you want to. It's it's right there, Jimmy Church. No biggie. YouTube. Yeah, we blasted past 5K. Wow. Wow. And then um you know, when you do that, Twitter or YouTube hits you with this thing, and I saw it for the first time today. You can charge for your subscribers. Click enable. I'm like, what? Really? I've never heard of that. I didn't know that. YouTube 
has pay channels. I never, I swear, I never knew that. Kind of creepy. I thought that was the appeal. I don't know why. I've never known, heard of anybody charging. But uh, you can do that on YouTube. Huh. But we're not going to do it, so don't worry about it. Later on tonight, we will have open lines. And uh, our secret mystery guest is going to be checking in here in a few minutes. So that should be right at the bottom of the hour. A little nervous about this and how this is all going to go down. So hopefully there's no delays. I just want to roll right into it. Um, Shoot me an email. Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. You can also go over to JimmyChurchRadio.com and uh, uh, go to the contact. I think it's the contact page, info page, one of the two. We've only got a few pages left over there. Also, I want to say this really quick. Uh, I'm going to get to the break and uh, let you hear our new announcer. Hmm. wonder who that's going to be. And uh, so we're going to have a new announcer in the first break. Um, now in cleaning up the website over at Jimmy church radio, uh, we did a bunch of changes over there and you can see it. It's a much cleaner, slicker, hopefully faster loading. It's still not instantaneous, but we're getting closer and closer to doing that. We want to keep it so interactive and stuff. You know, it seems like we add something, something's taken away and we take something away, something in, but it, But it's getting more streamlined. But what we did, I mentioned this on the show last night, but you've got to go over and check out the Fader Knots page. That Fader Knot page, uh, we put it out there today and kind of let people know about it for the first time. Go to JimmyChurchRadio.com right now. Do it. You can hear my voice. Go to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Click on that Fader Knots page. That is is artwork from our fans, from our family, from our friends, the Fader Knots. Go and check that out. If that isn't talent. Now, you know what? It could be somebody's son or daughter with a crayon. Send it to I'll put it up on the page. But what I'm trying to say is go and look at the talent that is tweeting right now, that is hanging out with us right now, that is shooting email right now, the people that call into the show, the people that you know, the people go and look at that talent. And if that doesn't put a tear in your eye, that fade or not page will freak you out. It messes with me. Go and look at that page. And if you are so inclined artistically, and you want to uh, you want to express yourself? Send it to me, Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Send something to Wolanda. <laughs> she sees everything first. You know what's funny? I, I, I'll tell you guys right now. I tell everybody right now how it goes down here. Let me tell you how it goes down. I was told about the fade or not page. I wasn't, it wasn't my idea. I was. Okay, we have a new page up. Check this out. And and you're going to talk about it tonight. This is what's going on. I'm like, oh, does somebody want to let me in? You know, want to clue me in a little bit of what's going on here? But that's how cool it is. That Fade or Not page surprised me. And it was like a gift. And I looked at that, and I've I've seen things trickle in. You know, but there's so much of it and, and it's and it's come in over, you know, the last six, seven, eight months, nine months. And it's uh uh just to see it all in one spot like that and the quality of what it's just it's crazy. Yes. Somebody said today, I think it was Walter, it's humbling. It is very humbling. That fade or not family, everybody in radio dom is jealous of what you guys have done. It ain't me, it's you. And I need you to think about that. We got a big show tonight. A big one. A real one. And they're all good, aren't they? Just wait. (laughs) This is Fade to Black. Tuesday edition. You know who that's for. Follow us on Twitter, at JChurchRadio. Shoot me an email to jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. 
This is Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. I am your very humble host, Jimmy Church. I'll be back right after this to get through a bunch of your email. I'll be back right after this. Keep your ear, ears peeled. Got a treat coming up. And in five, four, three, two, take it. You're listening to Jimmy Church Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, you have tuned into the latest phenomenon in late night talk radio, Fade to Black, starring the inimitable Jimmy Church, showcasing his continuing quest in pursuit of knowledge of the strange and paranormal. Sit back, open your mind, and let's get cracking. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I gotta tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three-letter. So, seriously, give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444 one 909 or go check out their website, www.nattaxexperts.com. That's N-A-T-T-A-X-E-X-P-E-R-T-S dot com. Tell them Jimmy sent you. This is KJCR at jimmychurchradio.com. On the Dark Matter Radio Network. <laughs> Hey, 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 man, that guy's got some pipes. This is Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. Only on the Dark Matter Radio Network, and it shall be. All right, I'm your humble host, Jimmy Church. It is the Tuesday edition. Uh, shoot me an email, jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. I'll click over right now, see what we got here. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mike Barra. Really? Get to that in a second. Got an email from Giovanni. Giovanni, he he was he's an original man. Giovanni was here before there were paid or nots. Uh, Giovanni's got an autographed Bible. That's how long he's been around. He says, Jimmy, I was wondering if Gobekli Tepe wasn't purposely buried, but it was filled in from Noah's flood. Wondering if anyone has ever entertained this hypothesis. Hmm. Hmm. That stopped me in my tracks. That's a good one. It's an interesting observation. And before we stop and dismiss it, if you think about it, there was trash, garbage, soot, debris. Hmm. Think about that for a second. Method of signaling, by the way, just tweeted in the, uh, the, <laughs> the the church black whiskey. And I got to say, 
method, that is pretty amazing. Go to if you want to check out this pick, just go over to Twitter right now at JChurch Radio hashtag DM Radio Net. Go jump in the sandbox with everybody. Check this out. And I got to tell you, <laughs> oh, I said go back, Lee Teppy. He did the wish. I get it. Okay, I get it. It's the drinking game. Jeremy Maddock just said GT bottoms up. <laughs> See, I don't even get my uh, when the joke's on me. But uh, yeah. And Robert Noel, he just said Robert Noel Jr. Noel Jr. Is it Noel or is it Noel? Robert, how do you say your name? Is it Noel or is it Noel? Could be either. I want to make it right. He says, yeah, it makes you think. It does. One word, go back, Lee Tepe. That's it. Dale, you're fired. Clean out your desk. Got another email from Corey. She says, Kim Carlsberg lived on a beach in Malibu when she was abducted. She now lives in Sedona and has her own business doing UFO tours. My husband and I took her tour and saw 25 flying objects with night vision goggles within 30 minutes. It was amazing. We shined a laser on them, and some got brighter to, as to let us know that they were seeing us. Once you see them and know what to look for, you will always see them. Anyhow, I would love to, I would love to have you interview Kim. Who knows? Maybe she'll have some insight on the base that you have found. Thank you for that email, Corey. We'll be in touch with Kim, and I find that very interesting. Thank you very much for that. That's how it gets done here. Mike Barra, satellites. Oh, how did you know that, Mike? Mike, you better there's you better not be talking to somebody because how did you find out? Okay. Well, okay. Mike, the, the buzz kill. How did you know that? Mike Barry, you're good, man. This email from Rick. A guest that may work out well is Danny Vendramini. He has a new theory on the Neanderthal and, and the links with mythical monsters from the past and present. Like I said, that's how it gets done here. Thank you for that, Rick. This email's from Les. He says, the guests I'd like to have on the show are Kyle Filson and Cam Hale from Expanded Perspectives. I believe all three of you together would not only be thought-provoking, but just fun radio. I don't know what the deal is with Kyle and Cam and the request, but we've gotten a few dozen in in the past couple of weeks. So I'm going to explore that. If they're listening tonight, um, call in. Call in in the, uh, in the second half of the show. Love to uh, hear from them. This is from Lou. <laughs> Lou. Always stirring the pot. But last night, Lou did a great job because he caused me. Well, let me read the email first. Lou says, so is Kevin Randall saying that Chase Brandon is a conscious disinfo effort? No, that's word for word. No edits. That's what Lou sent. Bad verbiage and all. But so I scratch my head. And, and Chase, oh, man, you know, Chase over the years. So anyway, uh, I've, I've, I've never really taken Chase seriously. So I went last night after the show after those comments from Kevin, and listened to Chase. Fell asleep listening to Chase speak a couple of times. And that dude is full of so much BS, it's just, okay, so let's just put it right there. Work for the CIA, supposedly work for the CIA. If somebody worked for the CIA in that capacity for that many years, I doubt that he would be on national radio talking about the things that he's talked about. But, so right there, I just put the brakes on. He talks about career people and the CIA, how they're dedicated. And even after you retire, you're still connected and you're still working and, and you love your job and you're committed to country and the Constitution and freedoms. That's what you do. But yet he'll go on national radio and spill the beans about Roswell in the same breath. 
I don't trust anybody like that. So well-spoken guy, clean cut, looks good, all of that. I'm just not buying what he's selling. I'm not picking up what he's putting down. I find it very, very difficult. And I gave him a good shot last night. Okay? I went in with open ears, everybody. And to hear his story about how he found the box with Roswell on it and how they were redecorating the CIA and cleaning out the old desk and putting in new desk and boxes were stacked up in the hallway and then they moved him down the hall to the hall of records or whatever. And, uh, the HID and, and he's walking around in there one day and he sees a shelf full of boxes and he sees a box that says Roswell on it. And he pulls it down and won't disclose what he saw inside the box, but he will say that it, the, there were bodies, there were ETs that it was a flying saucer from off planet. So yeah, yeah stop. <laughs> Just stop. Chase, please. So Lou, Lou, you're a bright man. You're a bright man. I, I, I yeah. Okay. Anyway, so that's, that's my chase story. If you guys want to go listen to chase yourself, <laughs> go, let's go look it up. Chase Brandon. Check out his pick. Good story, though. Good story. Good storyteller. He's the guy you want in a campfire, you know, kicking it. You know what I mean? Roasting marshmallows, s'mores, getting down at night, drinking some beer. That's the guy you want to tell the story. And I'll sit right next to him and tell the next story. And we'll have a great night. Okay? All right. Uh, Bonnie Blue wrote me today. And she, uh, this came in right before the show. It made the cut. Bonnie Blue, she says, suggested host. Check this out. This is cool. She said, uh, I don't know who to contact. I don't know if his show would be good for DMRN. But Phil Henry, Phil frigging Henry. He was awesome on KFI. He parodies, he, blah, blah, blah. he parodies Art Bell here and there to, uh, to, to someone said Art loved it. Well, I love Phil Hendry. I don't know. Was Phil like a nationwide guy when he was syndicated? Or was he just a Southern California guy? I used to listen to Phil when he was on uh, Extra Sports 690 down in San Diego. And I'll admit, the I think the first time I heard Phil, I didn't know what I was listening to. I, I thought it was real for a minute. The guy's got a real talent for what he does. But uh, there you go. Oh, George. George Ray Aruda just tweeted. George, I got your email today. Very cool. Thank you. By the way, just to let you know, I did get that. But Phil Hendry, does anybody have a way? Is he still on the? I don't even know. I haven't heard his name in so long. So if somebody has a way of getting a hold of Phil Hendry, help me uh, help me do my job and uh, the producers here and and send me what you got on Phil Hendry. I'll chase his butt down for you. Just get me a little something, something. What radio station is he on? Is he on Sirius? I don't even know. Is he still on the air? He's got to be. He's, he's too much of a talent. Love to have him on this show. Absolutely. All right. Uh, okay, it looks like uh, we're going to be put off a few minutes. So when I come back off of the break, maybe I'll take a phone call or two. And then we'll get ready to uh, kick this evening off. And I just have to say that it seems that you've been living two lives. One life, you're Thomas A. Anderson, program writer for a respectable software company. You have a social security number. You pay your taxes and you help your landlady carry out her garbage. The other life is lived in computers, where you go by the hacker alias Neo and are guilty of virtually every computer crime we have a law for. One of these lives has a future, and one of them does not. This is Fade to Black, the Tuesday edition. 
I'm your humble host, Jimmy Church. Shoot me an email to jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at jchurchradio. Let's get this one cracking. Do not touch that mouse. I'm going to grab a couple of phone calls from you when I come back. Stay with us, everybody. Big treat coming up. Let's go. Are you afraid of the dark? Don't move. Don't touch that mouse. You are listening to Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses, on jimmychurchradio.com. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark matter. You're listening to Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! Hoy, hoy, I'm Reese Evans, you're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back, Fade to Black, only, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your humble host, Jimmy Church. Follow us on Twitter, at JChurchRadio, hashtag DMRadioNet. That's what you want to do. Go hang out in the sandbox. Got a big treat coming up here in a few minutes. Shoot me an email to Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. I said before the break, I'd take a couple of phone calls. I've got them backed up. Let's take our first one now. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black with Jimmy Church. Who's calling? Where are you calling from? Uh, uh, hello, uh, Jimmy? You're on the air. You're live. Yeah, yeah, yeah Jimmy. Um, I'm, uh, wow, I can't believe I'm, I'm making this call. Uh, it's been 17 years. Um, um, there, there, there's a lot of hoopla on the radio of all these years on the internet, all the crazy, uh, 17 years ago, there was a call to the Art Bell program. Um, uh, a man, uh, he, he called and he, 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 he claimed to have knowledge of area 51 and it, it resulted in a, in a pretty big catastrophe. Um, some, I don't know, some call it radio history. I just know I've been living a nightmare ever since then. Calm down. Calm down. It's okay. Hey. Where, where are you calling from? Uh, I, <laughs> I, I have fallen for that trick once. I am not going to tell you where I'm calling from. It's only going to be a matter of time before they're going to be able to use it. It's like the, the technology has advanced. in 17 fucking years. Oh, I'm sorry. 17 years. And, and 17 years. And so like, yeah, here, here I am. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm calling your show and I know I can tell you what took the satellite down. When you are you talking about with back with Art Bell? Yes. Area 51. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 All right. Take a deep breath, my brother. All right, all right. It, what I mean, happened? What happened? There, there was all, there was truth back then, and there was this crazy guy in Philadelphia, and he called out of his parents' basement because Art Bell put on a program saying, "Area Fifty One callers, call on in." And this guy, who had nothing to do with Area Fifty One, he called in and he he put on this show and he said these words, and next thing you know, he said whatever he said, and a satellite went out, and his life has been a living hell since then. What brought the satellite down? I, I don't know. I, I, 
I, I don't know. He, he, he said things at the time about Area 51 and, and that there was a precursor and to, to NASA and, and the, that what the United States government is in contact with is not alien beings. They are beings from another world. They're extra dimensional and no one seems to understand that. I, I, listen, listen. You're yelling. Just calm down. Calm I'm sorry, down. I'm sorry. I, just, I know what I sound like. It's, it's just, it's been hard. Are you there? Something. Hang on. My computer, my mouse is acting funny. Hang on. What the? What was that? Bring that call. What? Keith, are we back? Keith, just text me. We're back? Yep. Okay. That was a trip. What went out on the air? Somebody call me, 323-825-5045. 323-825-5045. I want to know exactly that is buzzing me out that okay <clears throat> all right um wow wow are my phone lines down too somebody test the phone lines 323-825-5045 323-825-5045 i don't even know if i have phone lines we got everything back online. Okay, we got a call coming in right now. We got, uh, okay, two calls. It looks like it is working. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Hey, it's Rick. How you doing? Rick, what did you hear? Uh, I heard some guy just do like, uh, that's like he was uh, imitating this one call that Art Bell had from the guy that was uh, calling from a payphone and got, uh, got found. And then... Uh, he cut off, and then we had this really weird circus music. <laughs> really? Hold on. We got another call. Let's let's join these calls. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. What did you hear? Are you there? I can't hear the other caller. Yeah, he's he's with us. He's joined us. Okay, well, yeah, that's weird, man. And everything went funky here. Lost my mouse. That call just dropped on its own. That's yeah. Wow. And then some funky music came on. Yeah. It's like, um, I don't know, man, like old 1950s, uh, technical difficulties type of, uh, type Tec of music, like organ, like, uh, I just expect to see a bunch of clowns trying to get out of a mini Cooper or something like that. I mean, it's like circus music. Unbelievable. Okay. Here's this other call. Let's see if we can, uh, hi, you're live on fade to black with Jimmy church. What did you hear? Yeah, this is Steve from Bluefield. It same thing, man. This dude just goes off, has an episode on your show, Jimmy. That was insane. Well, it was. It wasn't only that. It was what happened to the computer system here too, as well. At the same time, yeah, they, just, they start playing some kind of crazy, like I said, some crazy circus music, and 
I, uh, th- we have it another. Was done. It was done. Here's another call coming in. What did you hear? You're live on the air. Oh, I heard somebody sound of schizophrenic. <laughs> I thought that was a setup. Oh, that was crazy. Off their meds. That's, that was crazy. Here we have a bunch of calls coming in. What did you hear? You're live on the air. Hi, Jimmy. This is Robert. I'm calling from uh, Indio, California, near the site of the uh, Coachella Music and Arts Festival. That was crazy. Uh, I, heard, I heard everything the previous caller said. It sounded like uh, somebody was uh, having a bit of a bad time, like a, maybe a complete mental collapse on the airwaves. I was trying to calm them down. Here we have a bunch of I, calls coming in. Let's just, I'm going to stack them up with everybody. Hi, you're live on the air with Jimmy Church. What did you hear? Jimmy, it's going to be an early winter. The nuts are falling out of the trees. <laughs> that was, that was pretty crazy. That, that was pretty crazy. That was that pretty was nuts. The, that was absolutely crazy. That's why we love your show. Dart Bell used to get that every, every night, just about. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I I'm stacking up calls here. You're also live on Fade to Black uh, with Jimmy Church. What did you hear? Is that me? Uh, there's a bunch of calls. I've got everybody on. Everybody's listening to each other. <laughs> Hi, you're live on uh, Fade to Black right now. Who's calling? This hey, it's is me. Mike from... Jimmy, it's uh, the filmmaker. Oh, oh hey, well, hey, hi, how are you? Yeah, I've got yeah. everybody live all at once. The calls are just coming in. I just thought I'd stack them all up and get everybody's opinion really quick. That was pretty bizarre. Yes. Um, didn't he call before, like, the next day saying that he lied? Uh, I don't know. I just remember that the the call 17 years ago, you know, I was one of, like, 20 million people that heard that call live that night. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. What did you hear? Jimmy. Is this is is that me? That's everybody. Everybody is live. All right, everybody. Everybody's on. Everybody's on all at the same time. Hey, listen. I'm going to disconnect the call. I want everybody to listen offline, and I'm going to keep the calls coming in for a second. Okay. Catch you later, Jimmy. I don't have my radio on. Oh well, you're going to have to go turn it on. (laughs) <laughs> oh, uh, all right. My, or no, my internet on? Yeah, yeah, get it on, get it on. I've got a bunch of Jimmy, calls I coming in. I recognize that guy's voice. That's the same guy from Art Bell. That's the oh, sa- I can hear myself. Yes, you can. So that was the same guy from 17 years ago, 20 yeah, years yeah. ago? I recognize his oh, voice. That's why I have no mean. clue about that, Jimmy. And he uh, I couldn't listen to him for very long, face. though, but uh, okay. yeah, yeah, I recognize live his sometimes. Voice. Okay, one at a time. I recognized his voice instantly. He called back to Bell a while after and, and turned himself in and did, redid the fake, and Art was convinced it was him. The whole thing was a fake, and that's an identical play. So he sounds the same 17 years it later. It is huh? him. I recognize the voice. Instantly. It, it is the guy. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for calling in. I've got a, another 20 calls backed up behind you. So let's okay. just keep okay. keep it going. Everybody, Thanks, Jimmy. have a great night. Bye. All right. That was trippy. <laughs> hey, Brian. Yes. Say hi to the world. Hello, world. <laughs> this is Brian Glass, everybody. Yes, the oh. gentleman that made the call 17 years ago on Art Bell, which which was radio history. Welcome to the program, Brian. How are you tonight? Uh, I'm doing uh, doing fantastic. This is so great to be on your show. And uh, do you know we are two days away from the actual anniversary of the call? Is that bizarre? It's called synchronicity, my brother. Yeah. Synchronicity. This is awesome. So, um, now (laughs) I, the reason why, um, uh, thank you for that. And, and I got to tell you that even though I knew what was going on and I was in on it, you were freaking me out, man. (laughs) You you. You were freaking me out. Thank you very much. I was thinking, uh, you know, okay, you know what? There are a bunch of calls coming in right now. You know what? Let's just see what people have to say. Let's go. Hi, you're you're live on Fade to Black with infamous Brian Glass. 
infamous is the correct word to use here, Brian, by the way. Oh, absolutely. And include my JL. It's my professional name, Brian JL Glass. Absolutely. <laughs> it is that guy. It is that guy. Hi, who, who's I calling? <laughs> Say hi to Brian. Hey, Brian. Hey, we Hello there. The first one. Uh, uh, you said it was better than yeah, the first one? No, no, not better. I recognized that his voice. Uh, I don't know why. I just did. I'm a big fan of, 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 of Hokey Radio, and I recognized his voice. I, I've played that clip dozens of times over the years. It was, I knew it was him. You know, uh, we were talking uh, over the last couple of days, Brian and I, and I went and looked on YouTube. And that his clip with art is it's millions, millions, millions of views. And well, that's a ball grabber. That one, it yeah, is, it is it, absolutely. <laughs> it was well, good. It, that was great. It was, and, and <laughs> hats off to you. <laughs> and, Thank you. Uh, absolutely, Brian. And and see, this is the thing is uh, not only is there millions of views on YouTube with that, but that was when art was at his massive steamrolling peak. And there was probably yeah. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 million people that night that heard yeah, it live. Yeah. I can't believe nobody else got it. I knew the instant I couldn't believe it. I sent an email and thought, Hey, I'm going to try to call in. I, I'm up in Canada. I didn't think I'd get through, but <laughs> well, thank I can't you. Can't believe nobody else recognized the voice. I thought that was an easy giveaway. <laughs> uh, this is a fake. <laughs> uh, hey, hey, I didn't get your name, Chris. Okay, hey, Chris, what city up in Canada? Before I let you go, uh, Oshawa. Oshawa. Well, where is yeah. that? That could be That's anywhere. Right outside of Toronto. Way outside of Toronto. Okay, up yeah. near. Uh, let's see, what would be north of Toronto? Uh, not much, uh, actually. <laughs> I don't know. I just moved here from D.C. Okay, so. you've already got a Canadian accent, man. You need to uh, you need to come down here well, and I'm hang born out. And raised. Oh, okay, born I got you. In Canada, I'm from Prince Rupert, D.C. So. All right, thank you, Chris. All the best, man. I'm glad you had fun. Anyways, cool. Take care. Right Great on, Joe. Love it. Thank you, man. See, you know, and did you have any idea, Brian, did you have any clue that you would leave a mark on literally tens of millions of people for a couple of decades? Uh, it has been a surreal 17 years. Uh, I was a struggling up and coming comic book writer at the time. I was also part of a, a touring theater group out of Philadelphia and uh, I was a huge fan of Art Bell because I would, I would spend my evenings uh, literally in my parents' basement, the literal cliche back in 97. I was in my parents' basement, and I would listen to Art Bell, and I would be on the computer, and I would either be writing or lettering my upcoming comic. And I would listen to Art. And the very first inspiration for the call that became the Area 51 caller was a night that he had, he had vampires calling up. And uh, he, he, at one point, he, he did it at one of his open lines, he did vampire line. And everyone calling up was supposed to say they were a vampire. And then at one point, he had a caller call in to say he was a vampire hunter. And that was where the first inspiration to kind of do the crazy paranoid guy to call in and be a vampire who actually wanted to be killed. And I spent that whole evening, like within the couple of hours that the free lines were open, trying to get through, and I didn't. And it was like two weeks later, he did the Area 51 caller, and I was working on a book with Mike Oming, at the comic creator Mike Oming at the time, called Ship of Fools. And that whole spiel I rattle off is the backstory behind our comic Ship of Fools about precursor to NASA, and they were extra-dimensional beings and disasters that were going to change the landscape of the world. And I just thought, I'm going to make the call. I'm going to play the same crazy, paranoid character. Uh, coincidentally, at the time, uh, in this touring theater group, I was playing a guy in a mental institution in a, in a show called Asylum. And I took the characterization, the, the language, stuttery pronunciation, and combined it all with the backstory of Ship of Fools and thought, let me make the call. 
And what no one on the air heard was I had a whole, I had boxes set up in the basement. I had a glass to shatter. And at the very end of the call, when basically things disconnected on art, was all of a sudden I shrieked. They, they found me, and I started throwing boxes around, and it ended with a bottle smashing, <laughs> seconds of dead air. And then I picked up the phone and went, what you have heard, Mr. Bell, was just entertainment for your audience. Click. And I realized I was no longer on the air. And when I tuned in the radio, there, all hell had broken loose. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'll never forget it. I remember I was so disturbed after that. And back then, uh, you couldn't you know, jump on YouTube or listen to files or go back and review. You were stuck. Unless you were recording the show like with a cassette deck or something. You you couldn't go and listen. And I, I was like, did that really happen? And the next day, everybody talking about it. And it was uh, it was disturbing. It was absolutely disturbing. And and I guess I, I've never spoken to Art about this directly. I would love for him to call in. Uh, Art, if you're going to call in on any night, tonight is the night that you call in. But um that the satellite going down and the feed going down, that really happened. Yeah, that is, I, I've been, over the years, I've been accused of various people who, like, of course, you, know, you make such a claim as this, you're the Area 51 caller, and immediately you get the people who don't believe it, you immediately feed into the air of conspiracy, and but there's the people that then did believe that, you know, it, that my end of it was theater, and then they've been angry, as if, like, I called art out of the blue to seed this false information, but it was part of the theater of that night, the, the Area 51 line. Right. And when you listen to the calls that preceded mine, the, 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 the quality of the, quote, performances varies from quasi-believable to, <laughs> that's a guy having fun on the phone. But it, it's the, the idea of the satellite going out in the middle of that call that suddenly took it to a completely different level that it, I didn't set out to, I'm, I'm, oh, let me, let me fool art. Let me fool the ufology community. Let me, let me trick people. It was part of the theater of Art Bell's show, and I was just a call that got in. And for me, the true, while, while people have said, oh, the moment the call is a fake, then, oh, it's all a fake, and I'm angry at him, and all the, the, the stuff that I've gotten. But the rea for me, the true conspiracy reality is, while my call was fake, Art Bell's show was real. Mm -hmm. I, I said something in a fake call that made a real satellite lose Earthlock, <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> uh, uh, and that is what has terrified me for 17 years. Absolutely. I mean, the he, odds of that happening at that moment and like it, and you could hear. You could hear it in Art's voice, whether uh, he was taking the phone call serious at that moment. We don't know what was in Art's mind. But uh, then to have the satellite feed go down. And I remember the guy calling up after that, and it was like Mark Furman was on the air, right? <laughs> or something, yeah. something, something bizarre uh, came on. And it lasted for minutes. It didn't, you know, it wasn't quick like we did tonight here, but... Mm -hmm. But it lasted for minutes. And and then when Art came back and he was on his backup generator or backup feed line or whatever he was doing to uh, to get back on the air, he was perplexed. And you could tell. You could tell. He was flustered. And he doesn't fluster. Yeah. So now this is the thing. Now, I want to touch upon this. And in a second, we'll bring on our uh, next guest. And uh, we haven't announced that yet. So don't say anything uh, just Absolutely. yet. Okay, um, is you went on to a very, very successful career in writing. And uh, it's not just in comics. But the thing is this. 
whenever you read your stuff and guys, the, the real good guys like you that know what they're doing with writing and, and have control of the pen and the mind, um, you get your influences from everywhere. And the reason why you and I are in touch is because you listen to this show to inspire your writing and you've done that with art over the years. And, but before all of that came into play, you were into the, uh, you know, well, yeah, the dark side, uh, ufology and ETs and dimensions and time travel and vampires. And you grew up in a haunted house. Yes. So tell me about that really quick. Oh, well, this, this literally occurred when I was in, in single digits and the legacy carried into early double digits. But, uh, yeah, I was a, a child of a, a good nuclear family, mother, father. I had an older sister, an older brother. And uh, we, you know, we had spiritual manifestations in our house that uh, occurred roughly around 1972, 73, and uh, one of the, the scariest culminations, and it, it really shocked me when I saw in um, uh, one, of, one of the Insidious films, they did a gimmick with uh, can phones. I actually, I, I talked to my brother when I was like eight years old, oh, let's set up can phones in the basement. And we made them out of twine, which is not known for its sound conductivity. And my brother was in the back of the basement. I was in the front of the basement. And, you know, we tried it. It didn't work. And then he went upstairs. And this is, this is in a pre-digital age. Uh, we are a family at the time that could not afford electronic equipment or tape recorders. And I'm just sitting down there. And I was aware of all the craziness that had been going on in the house. And I just I picked up the can and I whispered into it, hello there, ghosts in Jimmy's room, which was my brother's name, and he had a, a section in the back of the basement. And all of a sudden, clear as a bell in the can, came a voice saying, Hello, Brian. And in the back of the basement was the sound of cackling laughter. And my mother, who was upstairs, suddenly heard me shriek louder than she says she had ever heard me make a cry in all my years. And like she heard thudding and, and slamming and I came charging up the steps and she grabbed me like she practically clotheslined me and I was white as a sheet. I was panicking and they, they later discovered that down in the basement, anything that was between me and the staircase had been flung out of the way, including things I, I was not strong enough to move. But in that moment, the fear was so real, anything between me and escaping the staircase was flung by me out of the way. And that was kind of one of the, one of the big, big moments in that, uh, that scary time. How, how many years did you spend in that house? Uh, literally, the, the phone call to our, the Area 51 caller to Art Bell was done in that exact same basement. Wow. And your family, uh, was it just accepted? You guys just had to deal with it? Well, we, we came from a, we were of a Christian background. And so we, you know, my, my parents, they, they, like you see on uh, shows like A Haunting and The Haunted, uh, my parents, they, they brought in their, their local pastor and elders. And we literally had the, the cleanse the house ceremony from basement to third floor, and following that, nothing more happened in our house, except we abruptly learned our next-door neighbor began a series of manifestations, and she was of a Catholic background, and she ended up bringing in, like two years later, she brought in the priests into her home, but the, the manifestation was real, it moved down our block, and it definitely responded to the name of Jesus saying, get out. <laughs> wow, wow. The exorcist is what's coming to mind here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was never, I mean, that, that's Hollywood. It's over the top. What I, like, in, in real life, you don't experience anything that's that uh, super extreme. Uh, that, that has to be amplified for entertainment value. But when you're actually experiencing it, the, 
when you, you sense there's a manifestation, when something is actually happening, you feel it, and that creates a terror that no cinematic or televised treatment can ever touch. I want to welcome to the program your partner, Michael Oming. Michael, how are you tonight, sir? Hey, guys. Doing great. Hey, Mike. <laughs> hey, buddy. How's it going? Hey, look, we're on the radio. <laughs> That's funny. Well, yeah, Brian and I don't actually, we work together a ton, but we usually are work through email and such, so um, it's, it's fun to actually hear his voice for once. It's, it's great to hear your voice, too. Everybody, this is Michael Oming, and now in your partnership, Michael, Michael, you do, uh, you do the illustrations. Uh, well, before I even speak for you, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But Brian oh, yeah, is no, mostly, yeah, just mostly drawing. You're the drawing guy. You're the artist. Brian is the writer. But what comes first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> um, you know, it depends on the project. Sometimes uh, an idea will start with a sketch. Uh, sometimes it'll start with a, a name or a title. Um, other times, more traditionally. Um, so yeah, it just kind of depends on on the the, the thing at the time. There's no hard, fast rules about that sort of thing. Uh, I, I can say in my history of working with Mike, there's been a lot of combinations. A lot of times, Mike has literally come to me with a, simply a one-line premise. like uh, our, The novel Quixote that I wrote, Mike came to me and said, I want to do something with Quixote in the modern world, and Dulcinea is a television reporter, and somehow a helicopter slams into a radio transmission tower and creates a windmill. And out of those three ingredients, I wrote the novel Quixote that Mike provided hundreds of illustrations for. Now, we are going yeah. to uh, we're going to publish in just a second. I'll get, uh, I'll get the notification here that we've actually published the galleries for you guys. I didn't want to... Uh, get that up in advance because that would give away potentially what we were doing tonight. But uh, it should be up here in just a second. And I do want to go through those galleries. Let me see if it's up. Um, now, this is the thing. How long have you guys worked together? And I want to time this a little bit back to Art Bell. How long have you guys worked together? Uh, Mike, Brian, so I, what, when did Lakers Spandex come out? That was like 91, 92? <laughs> uh, that was 92. Yeah, we, we were introduced to each other in 1989 by another comics luminary named Adam Hughes. And comics people will immediately know that name. And we all, we all played D&D &D together. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we basically we launched our first uh, collaborative... <laughs> Loosely phrased collaboration together in December of 92 with a superhero parody series called Lycra Woman and Spandex Girl, the aerobic duo. And it was totally a, a, a spinoff, the 1966 Batman. Right. And uh, little did I know that Lycra was a registered trademark of DuPont. <laughs> And within one year, I was actually sued by the DuPont Corporation. And by that point, Mike, Mike had been snatched up and began working for DC. And I was eventually self-publishing my, my ridiculous superhero parody. And we renamed it Spandex Tights in the wake of the, uh, the controversy. And was it settled out of, I mean, was it just done? They just wanted you to take the name off? Yeah, and, and I had I had to turn over all of the back issue stock and like watch it get destroyed. Uh, it was like a Doctor Who episode, feeling feeling parts of my past. <laughs> Someone's well, feeling being said my for, past. for a large company like Dupont, that was probably the kindest thing that they could have done for our accidental infringement. You know, they didn't go monetary, which was a blessing because <laughs> we know, had no you, money then. You sure. know what I you know what I saw today on uh, Gene Simmons Family Jewels. Yes, I do watch that show. Um, <laughs> I was watching it today, and I'm not kidding. I couldn't believe Shannon Tweed did this to Gene. She made Gene burn his Polaroids. You know the famous, nah. yeah, the famous collection of whatever five thousand women, right? Uh, yeah, his Polaroid collection. She made him 
burn it. No, even she burned it while he was standing there. They they just and I was thinking, okay, I, I get I get it, but that was you know that's a big chunk. That's rock history lore. You know that <laughs> shouldn't that be at the um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Museum up in Cleveland? Um, you know, do you really want to do this? And she flamed it, and I saw it, saw it today on the air. <laughs> Absolutely flamed it. All right, so your gallery is up. And uh, going through these, everybody go over to uh, jimmychurchradio.com. You can uh, check it out. It says uh, Michael Oming and uh, Brian Glass. Brian, it says Brian Glass. I should, uh, we'll have it changed to Brian G, uh, J.L. Glass. What's the J.L. Oh. for, by the way? I'm sorry, say that again? What's the J.L. for? Jason Lee, not to be confused with the actor of the same two <laughs> middle initials. I am Brian Jason Lee Glass. Looking at these illustrations, uh, I'm going to throw this um, at Michael, if you don't mind, Brian. But looking yeah. at these illustrations, people that draw, and you can go over to our Fade or Not page, by the way, and look at some of the contributing artwork. Michael, you are now on that page, by the way. And, oh, awesome. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you. But when you are looking, when people look at comic book covers and, and comic strips and, and some of the fantastic superhero you know, illustrations, you look at that and you just think, man, that's really good. You know, it, it's because it's a different style, but it's difficult mm. to do. You can't just pick up a pen or a pencil and, and draw in this style. But you, you're one of the guys. You're one of the guys that does this for. It's just amazing to see, and, and I'm not just you know trying to blow well, smoke it's here. It, it's a, it's well, a, it's like like anything else. Like I, you're a musician, right? You didn't just pick up the guitar one day and just start playing amazingly. It's a, it's a daily dedication of uh, 20 years or, or more at this point. How? Um, and even as a kid when I started, um, I was just very very lucky that I was completely enraptured by comic book, comic book artists and art. So every day I was dedicated to drawing, whether it was full drawings or sketchbook stuff. And it, it overtook my life in almost an unhealthy way. I was having school to stay home and draw. Like I wasn't going out into the, to the woods for a cool keg party, you know, fr Friday nights. I was up all night drawing comics and, and trying to draw comics and honing my craft and stuff. So, you know, um, yeah, it doesn't just happen out of the blue, and, and um, I, I appreciate it. Um, I, I'm just I'm just scrolling through here and, and looking at these. I want everybody to know. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw you under the bus a little bit, Michael. Michael <laughs> Mike, Michael shoots me an email. I don't know a few months ago, and uh, and says, you know, Jimmy, it's me, and and I do this for a living. I just wanted to let you know I listen to the show every day, and I listen to your show and draw. And I was like, this isn't Michael Oming. You know, and I, just, I, was just, I was like, stop. Why would somebody mess with me like that? And then we started our, our correspondence, and it's all good today. But um, you just, you, you freaked me out. Um, and I just thought, <laughs> wow, how cool is that? But you really do. You listen to Fade to Black, and, yeah, you, yeah. and, and you use this to inspire uh, some of your artwork. And when did, when did that <laughs> That's really the dark side, if you think about it. When did when did you start doing that? Was it back with Art Bell, or were you listening to other late night radio back in the day? Well, definitely started with Art Bell. Um, I don't even know how I got turned on to Art. I just don't remember. I mean, because it was frankly, you know, a really long time ago. I think we were listening around ninety four, ninety five, something like that. Um, and I, I wasn't like a radio guy before. I was always listening to music, and I think what it was was just staying up all night working and, you know, you can only listen to your same 20, 30 CDs so many times when you're working, you know, 16 hour days or something. Um, so that's how I started listening. And I'd always been listening and even through all the changes that are went through over the years, whether it was a show or his personal life, I, I'd always been listening to that. Um, and I guess I took a little bit of a break during the 2000s. And then as YouTube started to grow, I got back into listening to uh, coast to coast and, going through archives that people would load up onto YouTube and YouTube just became this, you know, like I hear people complaining about like having to watch a commercial or something. And I'm like, there's millions of hours of entertainment 
for free on the show or on this channel, you could sit through 30 seconds of a, of a, of a commercial. Right. Um, but yeah, there's so much stuff on there and that kept me going for a long time. And luckily with the success of shows like ancient aliens, um, other shows started coming up, other interesting podcasts and sort of like that gap that was missing in the two, early 2000s started to get filled again. So we were getting a lot of these, these great shows and, um, came across your show through RFL's website. And, um, I'm really, really grateful that you don't, that you not only have your show on the radio, but you also have it on YouTube. Like there's no point I think in trying to, um, stop pirating of materials because people are going to do it anyway. It's a great way to actually get your, your, your shows and your comics and your films out there. Any, anyhow to other, um, to other groups. So you're just taking control of that and putting it onto YouTube instead of somebody like I'm, I remember a lot of the coast to coast stuff. Somebody would always try and put it on YouTube with like a different name or something goofy like that. Yep. Um, so I'm very grateful that your entire archive is up there and I don't feel like I'm taking anything away from you. I'm listening to your show, um, the, you know, the, the right way through your hands and stuff. So I mostly listen to it through, um, YouTube. Um, the only downside to that was I was in contact in the desert. And because I was listening to your show through YouTube, I didn't really catch up to the to the newer stuff where you were saying that you were going to be a contact in the desert. So we were there, and if I had paid attention to the real show, I would have been able to, to meet you there. Yeah, I heard the I heard the same thing from other people there after the fact. You know, Michael Oming was there. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? I couldn't believe it. I I just I was so bummed. I was so bummed. Um, because, too, well, you're up in Portland. I'm down here, so it's not like we're going to be bumping into each other anytime soon. And Brian is out in Philly, so yeah. you know, and and you were right there. We were we probably walked past each other. I'm know? sure we did because I remember seeing um, seeing some podcast stuff or or like a radio guy. And I, I'm looking at pictures now, and I'm pretty sure you were right there. It was right next to to one of the rooms. Um, I forget right. the name of it, but. Uh, yeah, and then I'm looking at pictures of you and Lynn Moulton Howe and um, uh, Dolan, and it was it was awesome. It was my astral self was there trying to connect the two of you guys, and you both ignored me. <laughs> uh, oh man, let's let's back up for a second. And Brian, I'm going to throw this over to you because you're the okay. writer guy. But um, uh, your inspirations when it comes to because you guys write about everything. Um, and it's, uh, there's no bounds and you guys are, your interest in all of, uh, those topics that we talk about this show, it's what you guys write about. Um, so let's back up for a little bit. Um, Brian with you time travel and I'll throw John Teeter into the mix. Um, <laughs> uh, and you laugh because you know exactly what I'm talking about and I love it. So, Let's go. Uh, let's go over to that. Um, what what what's your take on time travel, Brian? And how do you incorporate that into some of your writing? Uh, well, real world time travel, I truly cannot wrap my head around. Um, when it comes to to create, I'm, I'm not one of those uh, sci fi writers that's currently on the cutting edge of quantum physics and following like what what is the minutia of how it could really potentially be and pocket universes and bubble universes and bubble realities and all those things. Uh, for me, when it comes to should I ever, anytime time travel enters a story of mine, it is truly of the uh, Star Trek city on the edge of forever. It's back to the future. It really is more of a romantic view of time travel suiting the, the requirements of my story rather than it would be hardcore physics. John Teeter, real or hoax? Since you're the king of hoax. <laughs> Not intentionally. Uh, I, 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 have, I have no opinion on that matter. I'm sorry. It makes terrible radio. I have no opinion on John. Why is that? Uh, <laughs> I, I plead ignorance on my part. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, uh, oh, I love the theory of, 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 of Teeter that um, one of the reasons that his uh, um, prophecies or predictions from the future 
haven't happened or, or were wrong was because every every time you travel through time, you're creating a slightly different parallel universe. Right. So uh, that perfect setup of uh, you know the, the the thing the it's like a safety net built into the whole paradigm of John Teeter and, and time travel. So um, I, I love it. It's just it's just very interesting. It, it is, and and then when you connect, you know that is you're right. That's the safety net. That's the whole thing right there. That's the yeah, that's yeah. the safety net in the whole story. But then when you get you know, physicists and string theory guys coming into the mix saying, well, you know, but that's how it would be, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're like, yeah, well, we time traveling. I mean, they have, um, I believe, uh, trace some like, uh, um, subatomic particles that they've figured out of or molecules or some crap like that, that have, they've actually figured out they were able to move it a couple seconds forward or backwards or something. I forget what I was reading at the time. It was beyond me, but I mean, we're, we're already on the, the, the bounds of it. We're right there. There's no doubt. Yeah. And one of the one of the things when it comes to not only John Teeter but time travel in general was that a few years ago the trend in the scientific community was that, um, and it was because Stephen Hawking had mentioned this and everybody jumped on it, which was we can go into the future. Einstein says that is possible. We can go into the future, but going back in time is too difficult and nearly impossible. And I've always had the opposite stance on that. My view was always, look, the past has already happened. It would seem easier to go back and replay than it would be to go into the future that hasn't happened yet. That was harder for yeah. me to wrap my brain around. Now, Yeah, well, what do you think about uh, Andrew Basiago? Well, he's been on this show. He's been on this show. And uh, he is, look, if, 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 he, if he's a storyteller, okay? He he's, should be writing this stuff, man, because yes, this is all copyright-free material if you're, if you're claiming that it's um, uh, nonfiction. Uh, I mean, it's a big inspiration for me in a lot of projects as I listen to these, to these stories. I don't care if they're real or not. I'm very that's, agnostic well, about but, it. But that's I, my, I just love being in the moment of the story. That's right, and that's my point. That's mm, exactly yeah. my point. If he's a storyteller, then he's got me. He's got me. Yeah, he's in, the, I, he, yeah he's in the wrong area. He should be publishing this yeah, stuff and making absolutely. some money. <laughs> and, but what scares me about Bishago is his rapid fire, rapid fire mm -hmm. attention to detail. Okay, yeah, he does absolutely. not. That is that is the part that sucks me in when I'm listening to to, to a lot of the stuff. Um, I, he I, does I, not strike me as somebody who's kind of trying to make something up when he's asked the question. He has the answer, um, and it's not in this sort of like he's a lawyer, but it's not in lawyer speak. It's a matter of fact, yes or no, and this is how it is or why it isn't, and that makes it fascinating. Well, you know, and this is the thing, and you're right, which is this: it's the the it's in the details. And mm -hmm. if you yeah. um, and I've said this analogy so many times on the air, but I'll, I'll you know, for in fear of repeating myself, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm trying to stop myself, but I can't, <laughs> which, is, which is this. If you say there was uh, a car accident in front of your company, but you didn't see it. Right. Some crazy car mm -hmm. accident. So just some nutty thing. You know, maybe a guy got out yeah. of the car shooting. Right. And but you didn't see it. But you go mm -hmm. into the office and everybody's talking about it. Now you want to lie and act mm -hmm. like you were there and you saw it too, right? So you step up into the conversation, but you have nothing to offer. It's yeah. it, it's in the details. What were they wearing? How much change did you have in your pocket? What color was this, that? Who was across the street? Who was walking the dog? Yeah. Not the cars hitting, Okay, mm -hmm. that's that's something simple. It's the attention to the details in three D, yeah. and that's yeah. what that's what Bishago brings to the table. It's it's yeah. it's not one, it, one of the things that 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 he's got, which is that you know that photo during the the Lincoln thing, right? A really interesting photo. Um, but it also makes me think of there's there's another photo that's going around from like forties, I think. And it's just a, 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 I forget the event that this famous photo is taken from, but in the crowd is this guy who's wearing um, like a, a silk screen t-shirt underneath a jacket. Yep. He has like a very modern haircut and it looks like he's holding uh, some sort of like iPod or camera thing. Yeah, digital camera. That time period. And he's got the wraparound shades. 
yes, that's what that was the other detail. Um, so again, for as outlandish and crazy as some of the stuff seems, there's always a seed of truth or something you get that's that's solid that you can anchor it to, and that's what really pulls you in as a storyteller. Um, and that's the stuff that that why I'm, I'm drawing eight hours a day and why it keeps me going. It gets exciting. It gets exciting to listen to this stuff. It's like, um, I can throw sitting around two the fire. counter perspectives at you. What's that? Okay, kind of. They they seemingly contradict each other. On one hand, that attention to detail is exactly what a performer when you're when you're preparing for the stage, you you actually create a backstory for your character. Like actors don't just get up on stage or before film and play do the lines that have been assigned to them they part of the acting discipline is to literally create a character you create backstory to reinforce the the performance that you're going to bring and you fabricate all of that part of the reason the area 51 caller rings with that air of 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 truth or reality is i had created a backstory for me and Mike's comic, Ship of Fools. And I had all of those details of a history that never actually happened, but they were, they were right there in my brain, and I could pull them in the midst of the performance. Even though I had not written a script, the details were there, and the details gave the performance that sense of reality. And then on the flip side, I remember listening to Art Bell one night, and I forget who the guest was, but the subject was time travel. And whoever the fellow was spoke very matter-of-factly about, like, he, like Art asked, was, had time travel actually taken place? And the guy said, oh, yes, absolutely. And Art said, well, what are the, what's the proof? And the guy just flat out said, there are so many people who believe that Nelson Mandela died in prison, and then abruptly there was a new history where Nelson Mandela was freed from prison. And I remember my jaw dropping that night because I had in my brain the memory of, wait a minute, there, he died and there was outrage, and wait a minute, you mean to tell me none of that happened? And so here was a guest mm. on art posing, posing one of his theoreticals, and I'm sitting there in the audience going, wow, I'm one of your theoretical people. So those are the two I throw out at you. That's interesting. Mm. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, yeah. Hey, real quick, uh, before this flashes by me on Twitter, Rick says, ask them how Rick Leefield still gets work. Or Rob, Rob oh, Leifeld. Rob Leifeld. Le- Leifeld. <laughs> well, Rob, Rob, Rob is, um, he's an artist who, during the 90s, he's part of the image revolution, which uh, helped creators from working from the mainstream to uh, working in their own field with this company called Image Comics. And he has a very divisive art style. Um, and just not to get into too much detail, but the, yeah, the, the basic thing is he draws exciting stuff that strikes a chord with people. Some people don't understand why there's a chord that's struck there, but the fact is that he is, and there's a reason for him being in the position he's in. Haters gotta hate. So how did? <laughs> <laughs> so okay, uh, you you just told us who he was, but how does he get his work? Um, he's hugely he's hugely um, uh, famous, and you know people love his work. He's got a huge fan base. Okay. Okay. Well, it's one of the kind of thing, like maybe like a, I don't know, a, a music thing might be like a Justin Bieber or something where you're like, well, why is this person famous? People can't wrap their head around it. The fact that people do like this other person's work and stuff. And there you go. Okay. Can you guys hear each other okay? Oh, yeah. I, oh. I can hear Mike fine. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, you were going to say, Brian, you were answering at the same time. Oh, yeah, yeah, and I rapidly realized, yikes, okay, Mike's not backing off. <laughs> okay. uh, R- Rob was also one of the founders of Image Comics, and in, for, for those who aren't in the comic industry today, in today's audience, Image is probably most known, it's the comic company that produced The Walking Dead that has led to the, the very famous television program. So that publishing house was founded 
Rob Liefeld was one of the one of the seven founders of that company. So at the time, there was a fan base strong enough to support him and his his six collaborators, and they founded Image Comics, and that was over twenty years ago. Next question, Brian: Are you getting royalties from Tool? <laughs> Not at all. It, it, it's the it, it's the detriment of being the anonymous Area Fifty One caller. <laughs> I wish I was your, getting royalties. Your phone right? Well, um, as uh, Ken Lipson just wrote, he said, "No one draws crappy guns and and hung out of proportion." thighs like Liefeld. <laughs> so, uh, well, like I said, he, there's, people just like to, to hate on stuff, you know, and there's obviously a reason why he's got his position in the industry. Oh, I don't and, think, uh, I don't think Ken is hating. I think he's, he, that was done in admiration. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I've actually sat next to Rob at, at, at San Diego Comic-Con and as a human being, he's a top, top caliber fellow. Uh, I, I have the utmost respect for him and his family. They're they're super guys. Oh, when oh, let's talk about UFOs for a second and ET. Um, sure. Both of you uh, uh, have been uh, investigating, listening, researching this subject for a long time. So I'll throw this over to Brian first. Mm-hmm. Um, Brian, uh, any experiences? Uh, I had one experience that would fall under the category of, quote, UFO. I was out in the woods, and I was having a, quote, spiritual conversation with somebody. And you just, you got that that sense that you get, like, that, oh, like, there's someone right over my shoulder. Someone's, like, in the room, but we were out in the woods. And instead of looking over my shoulder, I looked straight up above me. And there was a star directly over my head that the moment I looked up, shot in one of the directions. And that's the extent of whatever, like, actual UFO experience I've ever had. It really freaked me out in in the moment. Uh, I guess I have to say I also, I I kind of subscribe to the John Keel, um, John Keel of Man Prophecies. Uh, I'm, I'm less enamored of the Mothman prophecies, but I really dig his book, Operation Trojan Horse. Yo. And that was probably a lot of the inspiration behind developing what me and Mike did for Ship of Fools that led to the Area 51 caller. This idea that there were beings masquerading throughout history and kind of keeping with the times. That, that was John Keel's perspective that it what that what we were calling aliens is exactly what what people throughout history were calling supernatural manifestations that his his key was that there was a phenomena always beyond wherever humanity currently was and it would keep evolving and changing changing its mask to always keep keep one step ahead of wherever our technology was. And as we entered the 20th century, they magically become UFOs. And so uh, do I really believe that? I don't know, but I kind of subscribe to that theory. Michael? Um, I haven't had any personal experiences um, until maybe recently, oddly, at uh, Contact in the Desert. Um, the best part of that whole experience was uh, the stargazing at night. Um, and we did see um, a star um, power up, I think is what they call it, where it's this uh, moving, it kind of looks like a satellite, but then it gets a very bright blast of light for a split second and then disappears. Um, so it was, it, it was enough that at the time you go, that might have been something, it might not have been. Um, but that's as close as I've gotten um, personally. But I'm also looking forward to now, because I'm in the Northwest, to going over to um, um, Mount Adams uh, to the East Eddy Ranch, um, mm. uh, run by James Gilliland, I think his yep, name is. Yep, James Gilliland. Yeah, yeah. And um, so supposedly out there, there's all these these lights and crazy stuff going on. And that's where they, you know, they first saw um, 1947, the beginning of the flying saucer uh, craze. What's the guy's name? Really famous. He saw the the UFOs from uh, from his plane and called them 
like they were skipping discs like saucers and that's where flying saucers came right from. up into Tacoma. Um, right um yeah yeah uh what uh, so hopefully i'll get to see something uh what what happened to us check this out we had a a cabin well a pseudo cabin i should say it was a a, du- <laughs> a duplex cabin um mm-hmm. about uh, 20 miles away from contact and I yeah. think it was, yeah, it was Saturday night when uh, they were back doing the night vision stuff. We were back at our cabin. And we had Steve Marillo. We had a bunch of the fader knots. Um, mm-hmm. Alex Mistretta was there, too, another uh, MUFON researcher. And Steve, he was the director of MUFON here in L.A. for, you know, 12, 13 years. So we had a little get-together out there. And, and we had a, a patio area. So we're standing out front talking. And sure enough, it was the craziest thing. Right over my shoulder, somebody yells, and one of the fader knots is is here in Twitter right now. Whoever saw it first, tweet. So um, I'll keep the story straight. Um, but there was a, maybe a half a dozen of us out on uh, our patio, and he goes, "Look!" And I spin around, and this thing shot up. From the ground, well, it was over the hill, but but from the ground, and it was a, a white sphere and just shot up and kept going and went up into the heavens. And it was it was bizarre, man. It was It's interesting you say white sphere because um out out coming out of uh, contact there was a couple of weird photos that went around. One was that weird alien presence on the stage possibly. Right. Um and another one was a woman who recorded an object in daylight. Um Flying through the air, kind of next to the car, and it was a white sphere. It was it was a white sphere, and this it didn't have a it didn't like leave a trail. I don't want to I don't want to have anybody think, oh, you know, you saw some fireworks, or mm-hmm. uh, it was nothing like that. It was it looked like it looked like a star, but it was close to us. Um, I'm gonna guess and say a couple of miles away, but it. It shot. It was straight as an arrow. Didn't have an arc to it at all, and just went until it disappeared. And it lasted for about maybe a second. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. if you're going to go one, one thousand, two, one thousand, yeah, it was about yeah. that long. So it was screaming fast, whatever it was. But uh, shot up and went. Uh, just went up into the blackness. It was crazy. Now, I saw wow. it with my own two eyes. I'm not yeah. saying this is what somebody else said. I was standing there and saw it myself, and I thought, now, how weird is that? We're out here at contact in the desert, and then that kind of thing happens. You know, what do you it's tell? It's so crazy when something like that happens. You, you immediately start replaying it in your mind and questioning yourself what, what you actually saw. And it's very quick, like, how, how quickly you can disbelieve your own eyes. And if you can disbelieve your own eyes so quickly, you know, see how hard it is to, to explain to other people who weren't there, you know, what that experience is like. Well, you can't. And we'll see, that's what I'm trying to say is I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that my audience here appreciates what I'm saying. Not only that, but we do have witnesses right now on Twitter that yeah. were standing there with me and that saw it first, actually. And but but they get it. But I wouldn't mm-hmm. go um, to the supermarket and talk to the checkout lady and go, "Hey, check this out! I just saw it." You know, yeah. you no, know, you just don't do that, and you don't want you don't want to have people look at you funny. But yeah, I, yeah, I did see it, and it was that contact in the desert of of all. You know, I, I had heard just like you, Michael. Uh, you weren't there, Brian, but I had heard. Uh, from a few different people uh, throughout the day that uh, that they were seeing things, you know, mm-hmm. that there were multiple sightings at contact in the desert. And I just find that. Yeah, I know strange. that uh, Jason Martell and um, Giorgio were actually out at, at where everybody had the military grade um, stuff. And after it kind of closed down, they came out at about 11 o'clock. I think it might've been on Friday night. Um, and they saw um, some stuff that was not satellites. Could have been something else, but it was not satellites. Right. Um, it was like right after everybody left. I, I just got the notice, station ID. Uh, this is KJCR, Fade to Black, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. We're talking with Brian J.L. Glass and Michael Oming. Uh, okay, got that out of the way. Um, yeah, Jason and Giorgio that night, uh, that Friday night, 
uh, Jason had texted me. He said, hey, man, we're free tonight. You want to come hang out with us? And I texted him back, no, I'm taking out the fader knots. We're going to go out and, uh, and, and hit this bar across the street. But I was, we were very close to trying to join forces. It would have been really cool to see what they saw <clears throat> that night. But, but, yeah. you know, those guys were out drinking too. I'll just let you know. <laughs> it, could, it could have been anything. Um, so, what do you think is visiting us? Um, I don't, uh, let's start with Brian. I'm going left, right here in my own brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brian's no on problem. the left, Michael's on the right. So, let's go left. Brian, what do you think is visiting us? Uh, I, I fall into that category of, like, without proof, no one can definitively say it is this, that, or the other thing. And it's, it's ironic how even in the, the, uh, the realm of ufology, like, different, there are as many degrees of faith as there are denominations in Protestantism. <laughs> and so, like, at any given time, I, I draw a huge distinction between yeah, this is kind of how I what I feel is happening versus what is there the proof that I can say what is happening. Uh, uh, stone me as you will. I I feel that there's a spirituality to whatever is happening. Less aliens, more metaphysical. Uh, than can necessarily be categorized by any of our known religions. Uh, I, I believe there is, like, what, what religion would call a demon is a manifestation of something that I believe masquerades and floats about and does whatever it's going to do for whatever its ultimate purpose is. Uh, I can't say, and that that's what takes my realm of UFOlogy into almost a supernatural horror uh, perspective on it all. Well, isn't it strange, uh, Brian, how everything throughout history always came from the stars? Before there were airplanes, and I'm talking, you know, going back thousands of years, everything came down from the stars. You know, whether it was angels or or different descriptions of of ships and and stars and everything came from above and i just find that interesting because if you're going to make a note back then writing on paper wasn't simple you didn't go down to office depot and buy a pen and a you know a pad of paper and so if you were going to make a note if you were going to draw something on a cave wall if you're going to take the time Battered. to carve something in a rock or carve uh, not only a drawing in a rock, how about writing a paragraph in a rock? You're going to take the time to do that. It was important. And that is what I find really fascinating. And we need to really step back and look at it in its totality instead of dismissing it as, oh, well, you know, they were being artistic, they were being creative, they were dreaming, they were, you know, it's fiction. No, I think it was much, much more important than, than that. They were documenting something that they saw. Yes. I, I am a firm believer in that. I'll throw it back to yeah, you. And, and, I'll throw it to you, Michael. Uh, uh, so I was, I was going to say that, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of along the lines of where Brian is, is thinking, maybe from a slightly different perspective. But I do think it's more metaphysical than, say, a nuts and bolts kind of thing. And one of the reasons I believe that, well, well, first of all, despite not having any personal experiences, I grew up with my, my mother who had uh, multiple experiences. And, you know, speaking with people like Brian, whose word I trust to, you know, with my life, you know, I believe what he says. So, so even though I haven't had the experiences, I've talked to people who, who, you know, I just believe that they've seen something. But when you look at the large picture, there doesn't, to me, seem to be a consistent explanation to this stuff. You know, um, the, the variations in, um, in aliens and fairy stories and ghost stuff, like they all seem to somehow tie in together, but yet without any real consistent basis. So I'm kind of believing it's some sort of larger phenomenon, maybe something that goes hand in hand with the idea that our brains are not the makers of our consciousness, but receivers of our consciousness, and that all this phenomenon has something to do with that. It has something to do with and it's a, a living intelligent force that's outside of our, you know, dimension, time and space that's somehow leaking in because it doesn't make sense 
you take the best investigators and you put their stories next to each other, there's commonalities, but it's still not a consistent universe. Um, which is also why I kind of cringe a little bit when some of the investigators seem to have answers. You know, my, my favorite investigators say, here's what we find. I don't know what it means. <laughs> um, and then put that forward. So that's my, my sort of take on, on the thing in general. Well, what happened with your mom? Share, share some of that with us, because it, obviously you're hearing about this probably from a very young age, I'm assuming. Sure. Um, sure. And that, that, that queued up my obsession with it. So what happened? Um, well, she, she saw a UFO. Um, she saw that the sort of classic triangular shape. She was walking with my aunt who's legally blind. Um, and they were, they were walking. It was nighttime. She saw it and freaked out. And it was a pretty quick, um, sighting of this, uh, triangle with sort of rounded corners, um, with definitive lights on it. Um, you know, they only saw it for a minute maybe. Um, but the thing that always stuck with me was the way that my aunt who's legally blind would say, I heard it in her voice. Like I heard the fear and shock in her voice. Mm. That that's the detail that stuck with me, even more so than just my mother telling it. Um, but my mother's also had um, uh, poltergeist activity happen around her. Where she's had like a a drawer fly open, and a whole bunch of pennies just flew at her for no reason, um, and a couple other things like that. There's some sort of weird demonic stuff uh, that she experienced when I was a baby, and she walked into the room, and it like turned red and. She couldn't move for a while, and so she said the Lord's Prayer, and then she got me out of the room, and then she just left the place. It was like a trailer home or something. So she's had you know, all these different experiences that sort of molded my mind around the possibilities of this stuff. How does it influence with uh, what you guys are doing? Uh, is it is it an easy uh, I get an easy library to just go and? And, and access to, um, or is it because it's it's a foundation of belief and it, it is something that uh, is easy for you to do because it's what you believe in and you have conviction? Um, I, um, and I'll, okay. I'll jump in first here and go. Uh, for myself, it has inspired two upcoming... What I experienced growing up, has uh, actually inspired two completely different uh, creative stories. Uh, if, if I were to do, oh, here, here's the story of what I experienced, it's not going to have the dramatic punch that we felt we who experienced it when everything was, ah, this is what we're feeling, in order to give it that, quote, Hollywood punch. Uh, you have to take what you experienced and then remove it from being your personal experience that you had. And it, it becomes the foundation. So in, in my particular story, I have, or in, in the, my creative path, I have one story that, that hopefully we'll see print in the next five years <laughs> that literally plays off of the events that I experienced as a child but I'm not going to portray them as this based on a true story. No, it's not going to be based on a true story whatsoever. I'm fabricating, but I'm using as a foundation actual experiences that I had. And then on the flip side, more of a kind of a psychological, sociological perspective, when all these events were happening, I had parents at the time, uh, my mother is still with us, uh, who they didn't want to broadcast what was going on in our home. It was it was very much the don't talk about this. And here I am, I'm seven, eight, nine years old, and this is one of the most significant things that ever happened to me in my life. And I'm being told I'm not allowed to talk about it. I can't ask questions about it. It has to be shut down and forgotten and so I've taken that particular experience devoid from whatever actual phenomena I experienced, just that psychological, sociological perspective of the, the person who experiences something so beyond, uh, so extraordinary in their youth and is then told you can't 
you can't know anything about it. You can't question it. You can't talk about it. And that in and of itself has become the inspiration for another story entirely that's in development right now that hopefully will see the light in the next two years. And, and, and Michael, with you, that's a great point, actually, Brian. It, you know, when when it gets taboo and you're told not to, uh, you know, not to, you know, to shut it down, it didn't happen. Or doesn't that just make it more interesting? <laughs> Don't you go? I mean, it do, doesn't that make you want to go back to the cookie oh, jar? Totally, totally, totally. And, 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 you know, um, yeah. Go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. Mm. No, no, you you go with it, dude. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's definitely a big part of it, and especially, and I'm sure everybody listening to the show has experienced this, where you find out a truth nugget to some larger uh, conspiracy or from this esoteric stuff um, as as a truth, and then when it ties into that, it makes it that much more real and possible. Um, an example for me, and one of the reasons why I'm so obsessed over all of this stuff. Um, was when my, I grew up without a father. Uh, my father was not uh, part of the picture, so I never had daddy issues or any of that stuff. But when I had a son, I figured it was my responsibility for him to find out more about that. So I went on a search for, for who my father was, my mom's help. Um, and one of the guys that it could have possibly been, because, you know, it was the 70s, um, uh, was a military guy. Um, in fact, they were all military guys. They were all sort of involved in, like, CIA uh, operations and weird stuff. Um, and the one guy I was talking to, this was, like, 1996. Um, it was right around the time when um, a lot of uh, social protests was coming out of um, South Central L.A. and Compton about the CIA bringing in cocaine and crack and other drugs to destroy the neighborhood so they could be bought up cheap by big companies and stuff. And it sounded like some crazy conspiracy, and people were just upset. Um, and I, I mentioned this to him cause he told me that, or, or maybe uh, I forget which order it came out, but basically what he told me was, yes, after Vietnam, I was asked to fly, um, heroin out of, out of Laos and Cambodia. So I'm hearing this from a guy who is potentially, you know, my father, he's an older dude. He has no reason to lie about this or anything. Um, and at the same time, this is all in the news and I'm hearing from a guy who was there. Yeah, no, we were, we were doing this stuff. Absolutely. So when you hear that 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 confirmation to a larger part of a story, um, it just makes it all the more real. It's just like um, on a less personal level when you read about how remote viewing was a real and an actual thing. So how far away is remote viewing from stuff like aliens or other supernatural stuff? Um, so it just gets you closer to this, this larger picture all the time. So the more personal experiences you have, it it, it – makes these uh these larger theories all that much more real and as a creator it makes you want to go to it all the time i'm always constantly pulling out um inspiration from it um my last uh, creator on series is called the victories and the ongoing section of that book was all ancient alien stuff i basically used the nephilim as the explanation of where superheroes come from and, and explored those eric von donnegan theories and such and it's lots of fun oh that is spot on the money Spot on. Yeah, both of, actually, both things that you just said. Let, let's back up. When I had heard, this is back, this is back in the eighties, and I had heard from uh, when I lived in Pasadena. I had heard from some African American friends of mine telling me these stories about the CIA inventing crack, and this was when crack was crack. It's not like today. Mm -hmm. I mean, this that was a. Everybody that lived through that in the 80s knows about that phenomenon that swept this country. And yeah. and I heard and I was like, oh, come on, you know, come on. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it was many, many years later, I was talking to, you know, it doesn't matter who, who confirmed it and said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. It was, I was like, no way. Yeah, really? I mean, I think at this point, and, it's kind of in the open. It's not even now. It's discussed. Yeah, now it's discussed. Yeah, now it's discussed like it's no big deal. Uh, but yeah. um, it's it's kind of funny that once you get confirmation of something like that, then you know what? Mm -hmm. It's all on the table. Any theory, you know, <laughs> it's all possible. I have one other quick, interesting personal story. It, it ties into Jim Mars, um, who I got to meet at Contact. He's he's so awesome. Um, but when he was on your show the other night talking about how um, the Nazis 
had probably actually built um, an atomic bomb, but they didn't have a delivery service um, for it, um, which is one of the reasons why I suppose they didn't use it. Um, but during this journey to find my father, it gets really kind of x ish and kind of weird. Um, so my actual father was um, a Nazi youth corps when he was a kid because he was born in Germany. So he didn't have any choice in that. You know, he just <laughs> born into the German Boy Scout. The cards you were um, dealt, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it, this, his story gets weird because he later flees Germany after the war and comes to America and then ends up joining the military and the CIA and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the interesting thing was this one story I was told from my half-sister who knows more about him than I do because he's half, is that one of the things that he was doing as Nazi for was they had him training to do dry runs to bomb New York City. So he was they were training him, you know, like in a flight simulator, you know, like wooden sticks and that kind of thing um, to, to bomb New York. And I always thought, well, that's really weird. Cause that means it probably has to be a suicide mission because, um, you know, the, the distance and the technology then, and you know, why would you bother trying to drop a, a handful of bombs that could be in a plane going across there and blah, blah, blah. But when I heard Jim Mara saying that, you know, they, that they were missing the you know delivery system, it kind of made sense. I was like, Oh, they were probably training these kids to go out and drop bombs, like like nukes over New York or something. Because mm-hmm. um, what I found really interesting was was of all the stuff that I'd seen about Nazi Youth Corps, none of it involved actual training of of mission type stuff. So that was the first time I heard that. And then when I heard um, Jim's story, then it put two and two together, and it's complete speculation, but it's that kind of thing. Again, when you hear it and it clicks in your head, that's the anchor for this the, the interest in this kind of stuff. That's why it keeps drawing you back in no matter how many years you've been listening to the same stories over and over again. Well, you know, look at Bob Lazar. Now, Mm -hmm. many, many, many things he has said, but that um, uh, element 115 aspect Mm -hmm. of his story actually came to fruition, and it's now on the periodic table. And that's when you go back and you, that's when you go back and listen to Bob and go, well, wait a minute here. Yeah. Maybe that's there's why I love listening to art soul shows is you, you'll go back and you'll hear stuff like that. A- absolutely. And like I said, that's when everything is back on the table. It goes right back on the table. Yeah. And, and you have to have uh last night we had Graham Hancock on the show. Did you guys listen to that last night? I didn't get to hear. Yeah, I'm okay. a, I'm, but I'm a huge Grand Hancock fan, so I'll definitely be listening. Yeah, to it. you've got to check that out. And one of the things he uh, that happened to him, and we talked about this last night quite a bit, was he was banned at TED, and he yeah. went out. He went out, and we all know the story. He went out on stage, did his 18 minutes, and then they pulled the video down. And uh, and as soon as you do that, it says a couple of things. Well, TED is based on one thing: free thinking. Let's go out. Let's talk to these guys that are movers and shakers in society that influence what we're doing, both technic, uh, with, with, well, Silicon Valley as well as entertainment and just everything. You know, it's all on the table. The guys that are the most creative. And so you put it out there and let the audience, those other free thinkers, grab onto what they're saying and hopefully mm-hmm. ex- expand and learn and, and so forth. The opposite of what the Vatican did 1,500 years ago, which was shut down uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. free thinkers. So, you know, and it goes to exactly what you're, what you're saying. You know, you can't, when somebody is free thinking and has a theory, uh, some type of hypothesis, and they're throwing it out there on the table, you listen to them and, and possibly mm-hmm. learn from it. Don't shut it down. And Bob Lazar yeah. is a perfect example of that. Yeah, and Graham Hancock's findings with, you know, all the work that he's done over the years, now, you know, that 10,000-year that mark is being broken left and right. You're constantly seeing new stories about archaeological finds that goes back 12,000 years that's not supposed to be there. So it's, it's kind of that, that saying. There's some saying about, like, for archaeology to change, you have to wait for the professors to die off or something like that. Right. <laughs> uh, luckily, it's happening a little bit faster than that. Um, not quickly enough, but, it, but it's happening. Well, Let's let's explore that for a second, if you don't mind. When you talk sure. about guys like Robert Schock and John Anthony West mm-hmm. and Michael Cremo, uh, Graham Hancock, uh, 
uh, when you there's a whole bunch more we don't need need to list everybody, but uh, those guys that have been exposing this gap in history that we that is an obvious thing that is there. Uh, uh, orthodox archaeology and and history is going to tell you that everything started at you know five thousand years ago, three thousand BC, Mesopotamia, the the Tigris River, um, Iraq, Egypt, and now we're finding out that that is not true, not yeah. true, not I mean <laughs> not true, and with yeah. I'm, I'm going to say it now with Gobekli Tepe. And, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, everybody laughs. Um, uh, but but now we have this huge, huge seven thousand year gap there, where guys like you know Graham and Robert and John Anthony West that were talking about this stuff years ago. Um, now it turns out that you know what these crazy guys, these fringe pseudo scientific guys, are right. Yeah, <laughs> they're spot on the money. And if those yeah. guys weren't out there letting it all hang out, we might not have ever explored that. And that is exactly my point. And well, I, and yours, too. Yeah, we know those guys a lot. Um, and what's interesting is if you get your hands on an archaeologist or a geologist independently, you know, where they're kind of away from, you know, the keepers of the keys, they'll agree with you. They are very open minded. I know a guy. Um, who was working at Gobekli Tepe, an archaeologist there. Um, and I was showing him some of Graham Hancock's ideas and some of the other stuff. And, you know, privately he was saying, yeah, no, this is a, this is a possibility. They're, these things are anomalies, not because we want to ignore them, but because we don't have an explanation. Um, so when you get a lot of these guys, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, they're so much more open-minded. But to their credit, the reason why they have to be so conservative speaking publicly is because the... You know, the holders of the keys can destroy their 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 careers. Um, they they are at risk stepping out. I mean, Robert Schock waited until he had tenure before he could you know step up and talk about the Sphinx. Um, and I don't blame him. No, you can't. You can't. Uh, hey, hey, Brian, what yeah. about that lost civilization aspect? Uh, are, are you going to incorporate more of that into your writing? I mean, it seems like it, that would be the uh, the endless well of creativity. I mean, you can go anywhere. Yeah, well, I, I, I love the idea of the history that everyone believes is not necessarily the history that is fact, and me and Mike are actually exploring that in our fantasy series, The Mice Templar, where I part of what I brought to that series was to create an entire mythology that is not necessarily the truth, and then the truth gets slowly revealed as the story unfolds. But uh, the, the thing that really leapt out at me as you guys were talking about uh, Graham Hancock being removed from his TED Talk was the correlation, and I don't mean to bring it all full circle back to me in Area 51, but that similarity between here, I'm just a, a guy nobody knows making a call, and I say something that that's going to go out to millions of people on the air and something shuts it down. Mm -hmm. And in the process of trying to silence it, it actually then made it more popular than, than who would have believed a genuine, a genuine paradox. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, know, you know, I have, no, I have noticed listening to your show and especially arts over the years, um, and I'm sure every every radio show has problems with communications, you know, where there's glitches and stuff. But so often, way more than any of the radio programs out there, when somebody starts saying certain key phrases, you hear, like, clicking. Yep. You start having problems with the phones. They'll yep. get dropped off. It's never completely shut down, but you can tell it's almost like somebody is, is effing with them on the other side. Yeah. Like, it, playing it's... around. It's, always at a pinnacle peak critical moment. It's not during the commercial breaks. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. It's not. Yeah. Art did lose satellite co connection, which he couldn't do if he wanted to. Right. While Brian was doing his thing, that was, that was something else. That was, that's the scary part. That's the part that freaked us out. The next day was that was beyond Art's control. And it was like 10 minutes of dead air. Right. That's, right. That's, right. That's suicide for radio. 
this total suicide for radio. I, you know, I talk for 10 minutes and that is considered dead air. Trust me. So anyway, (laughs) um, uh, backing up, uh, uh, at the beginning of this, uh, uh, last year, when we, uh, first, uh, went on with a dark matter, when dark matter started to kick off, um, very early on for about two or three months, but I'll never forget the first night this happened. We get this phone call from this general, right? And it pops in and I ignore it. And I thought, well, you know, who is that? And then after the program that night, I didn't answer the phone call because of the name that <laughs> I saw on the screen. And I still haven't said the name in public, um, <laughs> but I see the name. And so after the show, me and the producers, we were here in the, in the studio and, and somebody Googles, right? Oh man, he's a member of the joint chiefs. What? <laughs> Right. And so I go and I wow. look, I look and you've got to be kidding me. Right. And wow. so the next day on the air, I tell the story. Boom. He calls in the middle of the show and I'm looking at it and I'm like, no, I was scared. I, you know, and it, yeah. but, but it was right there. And he called during the show, probably, over about a month period, maybe a half a dozen times, you know, like every other night kind of thing. Mm. And, and I wouldn't, I, I, I never picked up the call. And then one night we were doing the remote broadcast with Richard Dolan and, yeah. uh, and which was a great show. And right there uh, during the, and I turn around to Richard, Richard was sitting next to me and I go, look at this. He's calling right now, and he leans over, and you should have seen Richard's face. I'm sure it's in the wow. video. I haven't gone back and watched it, but um, you should have seen Richard's face. And wow. he looked down, and, and I'm just thinking, why? This is the thing. When you have somebody like that, don't you have people telling you what to do? You know, somebody dialing the phone for you or – you know what I mean? It's, you're not, you're not well, a lone did you, wolf. Did you – I'm sorry. Did did you see the the documentary um, Mirror Men or Mirage Men? Yes, Mirage Men. I've had those guys on the show. Yeah, that's right. Um, actually, I think that's how I got turned on to your show. Was I knew uh, from a posting on Facebook about Mirage Men. I looked them up and saw that they were on on your thing, and I think that's how I got into your show. Okay. Um, but anyway, this is the idea of the you know the government using um, true and false UFO information via you know Richard Doty or not Richard Doty uh, Doty, uh, I forget his name. Um, uh, you know, sending out Paul Benowitz, you mean with, Paul Benowitz? Yes. 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 Um, you know, sending out false information and true information to cover up um, whatever is going on. Uh, but most especially just, you know, very uh, down to earth, nuts and bolts technology to cover up that stuff by mixing up with these crazy stories and stuff. And to find that it's actually happening, because when I heard of these stories about this information, um, uh, uh, agents over the over the years, I always thought anybody saying that was feeling themselves to be a little too important. That the government was going to take time to talk to some UFO investigator, give them fake information for what reasons doesn't make sense. When you look at this larger picture, it does make sense, you know, and it does make sense that you know uh, this guy who was calling your show um, and and following your show is probably just kind of he just knew you were allowed to do that kind of thing and give certain amount of information to mess with people or to get the information out there in case there is going to be some sort of disclosure thing at some point. I, I don't know, but I found it completely fascinating and validating. I, 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 I've ahead. been labeled as a disinformation guy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Of course, you think? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the times that I, that I called back into the show, the t- there was one time I tried to recreate the call as a guy in the hospital. And then later when I did the, the infamous confession, and hopefully I'm speaking a little more confidently now than I did then, but you know, immediately it just, uh, Mike coined a phrase or not a phrase, but Mike, Mike coined an idea years ago, uh, that the moment you enter conspiracy, any effort you apply to refute the conspiracy becomes part of the conspiracy. That's exactly And I have taken that as gospel into any time any of my stories enter, even on the fringe, uh, even in an interpersonal level, 
uh, the moment you enter that realm of trying to refute what someone else has convinced themselves they believe, right. you become the Ouroboros. You're the snake eating your own tail. That's right. It, it, on this show, now, anybody that knows me intimately, that, that are friends in my circle, knows that I'm just a guy. Okay? I have no Sweet. connections. I know, you know, there's not, no influences on me from any. It, this show is me. Period. And I yeah. still get, still get daily emails, uh, stuff on Twitter and YouTube, and and that I'm just this, I'm a disinfo guy. Look at the name <laughs> of the show, Fade to Black. My name is Jimmy Church. It, it's it's <laughs> all it's all he is just, and they don't get it. I know, yeah. I know the reality of it, but you're not going to convince somebody else if that's what they believe, and then. But back to your point about Paul Benowitz and Richard Doty, when you have that out there, that's the one that we know about. That's the one that is true. That's the one that yeah. we can prove. That's the story that we can prove. But it, it shows that, yes, they do do it. They have the capability. They have, mm -hmm. they have the, the motive. The motive is there, yeah. too, as well. So when you combine all of that together and, and you've got this one example, it's just like anybody else. If you go on... If you go and lie, you swear on the Bible, you, you jump into the witness stand, and you lie, and you get caught in that lie, that means everything else that you've said is a lie. That, that's yeah. it. That's, that's the way the world works. Well, once Washington did that with, with Doty and Benowitz, and that's proven, and it's out there, well, and it's documented, um, mm -hmm. and not refuted in any way, well, then what are we to believe? And it's yeah. that simple. It, it, there is no, there's no gray area here. Are you with me? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I also believe that, um, conspiracy, I'm, I'm in love with conspiracies from, from bottom to top. I love watching them, believing in them, not believing in them, the whole thing. Um, I'm convinced that conspiracies largely are a reaction to a certain amount of trauma that America has gone through. Um, for example, watching the president's head get blown off on television. Right. Um, you know, how can such horrible thing happen? It can't be as simple as, you know, one guy doing it. It has to be this much larger story. You know, why are we seeing stuff in the sky? It can't be as simple as, uh, misidentified satellites and stuff because, you know, there's the threat of imminent nuclear war and such. So I, I, and that doesn't mean that those things aren't true. You know, I don't believe that there was a single guy shooting at, at Kennedy, but I, I think that a lot of conspiracies are looking for answers from almost a traumatic point of view. It's almost the way like we personally get anxiety and, 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 um, social fears through trauma that's happened to us. I think on a social level, that's where a lot of these conspiracies are coming from. And it doesn't help when we find out that we are being lied to. Um, like we know for a fact that CIA and FBI have used uh, mainstream newspapers to plant stories. We, we know that that's, that's a matter of fact, that's a matter of record. Mm -hmm. So how can you trust anything you're being hurt? You're, you're seeing from TV. When I watch this, is, <laughs> okay. I'm going to have fun yeah, with that. I'm going to, not you. It's, it's no, CNN listen, and, I'm gonna, and I, that's and right. That's guys. right. That's exactly it. And uh, I'm going to have some fun with this. Uh, I, I don't like it when people say, well, you know, that movie or in the series, this TV series. But a good example of, of this is when you watch 24, okay, and you <laughs> watch how these guys just sit around from the White House on down and have whatever, whatever, the, whatever is going on, the, the exact opposite is what they present. Whatever it is, whatever they swing, whatever mm -hmm. the story is, okay, we're going to yeah. talk. Okay, we know this is blue. Okay, so it's red. Okay, you know, and that's, that's the way that everything is dealt with. And I just, I have this funny feeling that that is just based on reality. When it comes, yeah. when it comes to Washington and they're feeding their information to the mainstream media, and it trickles out, and it goes mm -hmm. out into the ether and, and, and across the Internet and across satellites and direct TV and cable. Whatever the reality is, whatever it is, 
hundred eight, flip it over, and then that's what we get. That's yeah. that's it. That's it. So when you hear a story, when you hear some breaking news, flip it around, and you're going to be <laughs> closer to the mark. Look at MH. Yeah. You know, look at MH one seventeen. Okay. Mm-hmm. When, that when that plane uh, uh, fell out of the sky, it was seconds later. CNN and Fox and everybody else had the details. Oh, it was a Russian missile. It was this kind of missile. It was shot from here. It was a, it was way too much information, way too quickly. When you know Wolf Blitzer, you know, um, uh, you know Anderson Cooper wasn't standing there watching this happen. You yeah. Know, you, well, they're all reading off the same script. There's there's a there's a handful of um, YouTube clips out there where there are key phrases for for these events that happen. Let's take that one as an example. Um, and you will hear it whether it's on CNN or Fox or any local station because they're all being there's like a technical term for it even they're all being read off of the same news feed. Right. So even their their reactions and key phrases are all the same as if they're on the same team as if. Nobody's doing any investigation as if they're being fed the story. Right. And you just see it play out. And like how as as a country are you supposed to react to that other than distrusting? Yeah, and 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 I've tried to make this point, and you're exactly right. And let's say let's say ground zero for the key phrase uh, as it as it gets fed out, let's just pick a word, a smiley face. Okay, mm-hmm. smiley face. Well, then you go and you listen to or read or in the car, on the radio, television feeds, switch channels, check it out, and they will all say smiley face. Yeah. Nobody, yeah. Nobody's yeah. writing or creating or investigating or researching or doing journalism. They're yeah. getting the feed from ground zero where smiley face started. And suddenly it is smiley face across the board. There's no research going on there. You're at 100% on the money. I have a crazy conspiracy about the visual end of exactly what you're talking about. Okay, hold it right there. I've got yep. to do a, another station ID. This is KJCR, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We are with Michael Oming. And are you ready? Brian J.L. Glass. <laughs> to separate him from all of the other Brian Glasses out there across the country, J- Absolutely. <laughs> JL is in there. This is Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Okay, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, uh, I remember this. 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 I, I don't know if this is one of the popular theories out there or not. I'm going to relay it to you as it flashed through my own fevered brain the night of the Academy Awards when the guys that won the the special effects Oscar were part of a special effects house that was basically dissolved. And I know both both Mike and me, we personally know, we we have colleagues and friends and professionals that are in the special effects field. And immediately the crazy thought, me as a storyteller, and this is just fodder for conspiracy, the thought that flashed through my head was, if you can relegate if you can control special effects in the future, yeah, you, you can rent out your guys to do Star Wars 7. You can rent out your guys for the Transformer franchise. You can create whatever the latest Hollywood spectacle is under some form of control. But if you control the special effects guys, you can actually create the reality of news that people will see on their televisions 10 years from now. You guys want to take some calls? Absolutely. Let's sure. grab one. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black with Brian and Michael and Jimmy. Who's calling? Where are you calling from? I'm sorry, I've got the wrong number. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, and it's all part of the, it, it all feeds into itself. How could have somebody have the wrong number? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I've got the wrong number. That's hilarious. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I'm going to keep the phone lines open. There was a, a couple that came in I was ignoring because I didn't want to interrupt you guys. But, uh, yeah, let's open up the phone lines. 323-825-5045. If you want to Skype in, it's Fade2Black14. Um, is there any... 
area where when you, when you have the freedom to when it comes to comics and we, I'm saying comics, you know, uh, illustrated novels. Though when it, when yeah. it comes to the comics is perfectly acceptable. Uh, is is it's it not a dirty word? Okay, good. <laughs> Is there a zone that you guys can't go into? I haven't experienced it yet. Exactly. Michael, is there anything you can't Um, draw? You know what? There's nothing more frightening to America than the penis. (laughs) (laughs) And I can draw all the naked women I want. I can draw people getting the heads exploded. I can draw guts being pulled out. If you're Red Powers, there's plenty of that going on. But God forbid you draw a penis. Um, <laughs> people think you've just done the worst thing ever, and that's a big problem. <laughs> I'm going to say there's that's, early that's issues of the Mice Templar where word balloons cleverly cover and conceal all of the inadvertent penises <laughs> in rocks and slabs <laughs> that Mike drew. <laughs> Actually, this is really funny. So I do... <laughs> I do tend to have um, spectacular sort of imagery uh, subconsciously in my work, um, but it's never overt unless it's called for in the scene. But there was this insane retailer who took the very first issue of Mice Templar and turned it upside down. And because of the composition, he was convinced we were drawing subliminal images of, of, a, um, of a vagina on the screen. And it was nothing like that at all. Um, and it was really insane and also great because it got us a lot of uh, publicity. I'm 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 looking now uh at your drawing of me. I want to make sure it's not phallic. <laughs> oh, it's phallic. Well, it is. I mean, you're on a pyramid and yeah. it's shooting straight up. <laughs> yeah, that is phallic-y. It's phallic-y. <laughs> it's not really <laughs> it could be phallus. It could be. Yeah, but that is a, that's always the weird thing see so as uh, doing creator own work and such. Um I am always interested in what's acceptable and what's not. I'm not one of these people who's trying to push boundaries for any reasons or whatever, but I'm just always shocked at what bothers people and, and what doesn't. Um, and it's, and it's very strange. And whether it's coming from the left or the right, it doesn't matter. It's, it's always an inconsistent, um, set of boundaries. And I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this being on the radio and sure. being a musician and stuff. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, have you guys been over to the fade or not page and looked at this artwork that, that, that has been done? Have you guys checked this out? And if not, you should. It's uh, some of it is some absolute. Of it is, it's really old. Some of it goes back to uh, early nineties, even the mid nineties. No, I'm talking um, about our. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's grab another call. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black with uh, Brian Glass and Michael Oming. Who's calling? Yeah, this is Brian from Portland. Brian from Portland. Oh, right down the street from uh, Mister <laughs> Oming. How how are you tonight? Very good. I have a question for uh, Mike. Uh, who who is his favorite like uh, creative collaborator? Oh well, I work with a lot of uh, Brian's in my life. School of uh, the Brian. So, like, who would be your favorite Brian? Let's just get it down. To my that. favorite Brian, spelled B R I A N, would be Brian Michael Bendis. My right, creator. Thank Power. you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's all I wanted to hear. Thank you. Okay, you got Alrighty. it. Thank you. But my that Brian was... has two prongs that will stab you in the heart. <laughs> uh, so for those of you, just to uh, <laughs> my our friend uh, Brian Michael Bendis, the co-creator of Powers and um, one of the lead writers for Marvel Comics, just coming on to bust my balls. Is that who that was? Yeah, yeah. Brian's... Um, an incredibly uh, uh, famous and talented comic book writer, um, and kind of my other wife. I, I always say, so we've been working on powers together for so long. It's it's like a marriage. Um, I have and, to uh, keep really nice him out of bed. What, what's that, Brian? I have to keep pushing Brian Bendis out of bed. <laughs> wow, <laughs> Michael is mine. <laughs> I don't care that you have Hollywood and TV. <laughs> Michael is mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Brian, both Brian's have uh, been working with both of them for like almost 20 years now. It's crazy. Um, and a um, uh, little promotion sort of thing. Uh, Powers, the book that we're doing, is being made into a, a television series right now through uh, through Sony. Um, and uh, that'll be out in like November, December, I think. I think it's December. Well, ex- December. Can you clarify on that? Because you had told me about that the other day. And uh, I think, I don't know if it was in an email or what, but. Um, you were a little unclear. What 
Are you drawing for uh, it? Is it well? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> so Powers is a superhero crime drama that we've been doing since about 2000. Uh, Brian Bendis and I. Um, and um, it is being filmed right now in Atlanta as a television series, the very first um, television show being produced by Sony PlayStation to be part of their new um, uh, live or uh, their new streaming programs, kind of like Hulu or Netflix. But it's directly through Sony PlayStation um, and starring uh, Charlotte Copley and Eddie Izzard um, and a handful of other uh, uh, stars. I'm forgetting names. Uh, uh, off, off the top of my head, but it's directed by David Slade, who did the um, sure. uh, Hannibal television series. Yep, yep, yep. yep. And uh, it's happening right now, and it'll be out. So it's live First. action. It's live action. It's not animated. Yep. It's live action, and it will be uh, distri- distributed on Sony PlayStation only. That'll be the platform? Yep, just like HBO. If you wanted to watch uh, Game of Thrones, you have to have HBO. If you want to watch Hours, you got to have PlayStation. And uh, luckily for us, lots of people do. Does it? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, does it pay? Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm, I don't work for free anymore. Right. <laughs> um, and you will see a lot of my art on the show. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, you know, I'm I, I'm saying that with uh, I'm being genuine. I, when you do sure. something like that, and and that is the platform, I always wonder. Where's the revenue generated from? Obviously, Sony is 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 paying for everything, but Sony's going to recoup. So, well, first I want to I want to say that Sony is part of no conspiracies that I could possibly think of. <laughs> <laughs> um, secondly, the, the the first thing you need to do when you have a deal with anybody is to have good lawyers to look out for your interests. And as you know, as a musician, um, and as you've seen time and time again throughout. You know, creators' histories. Not enough artists do that, um, and and we've been very lucky to be represented well. So we're taken care of, um, and we're very happy with Sony. They're doing an amazing job. They're keeping us all super involved. Brian's one of the writers, along with Charlie Houston, who's written um, lots of novels and has had experience in comics. I'm um, doing a ton of artwork for the show. Um, so yeah, we're we're in very good hands. We're very excited. Okay, we got another caller. Who's calling? Where are you calling from? No, this is Steve from Bluefield. Steve from Bluefield, how are you tonight, sir? I'm good, Jim. How are you? Say hi. You know I'm great, man. Look, oh, look, I'm, look who's on the show. I, Pretty- that's, a, that's a wasted statement. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say that you had me from the word go. I mean, I was taken out like a big fat piece of chocolate cake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm say, telling you. Say, say, I, I've done because I usually listen to the show with my headphones on, and my wa- my wife sits beside me and she watches TV or whatever and I jerk my headphones out and I'm like listen, you, know, you gotta listen to this crazy guy named called in Jimmy Church listen <laughs> and, uh, got my wife all interested in it, and, you know, and then it's it's a hoax <laughs> well I mean it's, it's a joke, not a hoax well, there's a difference between a hoax and a joke that was a joke. Yeah, say thank you to Brian by the way. Thanks Brian See, oh, thank you very very much Listen, the thing is, the, the, the thing is, Steve, is um, uh, that call, that call, as long ago as it was, was heard around the world by millions of people. It has lived in infamy on the Internet. I have listened to it so many times over the years and scratched my head on it. And uh, just like, you know, Orson Welles with War of the Worlds, you know, it influenced some people. Uh, millions think that it was real, and some don't think it's real. Whatever, but it influenced a lot of people, and it it was radio history. That for art, l- let me make something perfectly clear, and art will understand everything that I am saying right now. You can't, you can't pay for that. You can't, you can't that accidents like that only happen once in a while and and for art it was a great thing it was a great thing it doesn't matter if it wasn't real or not it was great for everybody to listen to it was entertaining it was shocking it was unbelievable you can't put a value on you you can't and and so tonight when i first spoke to brian when i got him on the phone brian what was the first thing i said to you man when he said hey jimmy i go what was the first thing that i said you're it. I hear it. You're the guy. <laughs> I didn't say hello. 
I didn't. I go, dude, it's really you. <laughs> yeah. You know? And so um, I just wanted to um, a, a introduce Brian to to everybody. I knew that all of arts, uh, everybody that listens to this show, listen to art, and, and we're very familiar with that phone call. And so we could just clear the air, get it out there, and just have some fun with it. And that's what we did tonight. And also, if you don't mind interrupting, I really want to point out to anybody who's feeling disappointed or shorted in any way or, or feels like this somehow post nigh you know, post into the eye is a conspiracy thing or Area 51 or art show or anybody's sense of dignity about this. Um, there's still this, you know, well, Brian, first of all, was, was playing a part, and that was this open, open lines kind of thing. Um, but also there's still a huge mystery of what actually happened that night. The, the idea of the, the show just being knocked off the air like that, um, that, that opens up another door. And by being truthful and stepping out in this, I think people who are concentrating on Brian's ramble were missing out on what really happened that night. What, what the larger real mystery was, was why was our knocked off the air via satellite outside of his control for, for that amount of time. That's really yeah. what the focus should have been this whole time. So anybody who's feeling upset, like just refocus, man. Let's figure out what actually happened. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, that's I mean, what I was saying, saying earlier. That, you that know, it's the NSA not... listening, okay. and they are thinking we've got a whistleblower on the radio right now that is spilling yeah. information. You know, and we're like, we've got to get this stopped right now. Yeah, and how many are looking at it like it's a joke? Yeah, and how many areas <laughs> they thought it was real? On vacation, were shot that night. Yeah, we, exactly, exactly. And right. then, but when you when you take it again, I'm going to say this again, but we have to when you take it in its totality, then we've got something that. What are the odds? What are the odds? I say it every yeah. night on the show, but coincidences, synchronicity, I don't know. But what are the odds? And it really happened. And you combine it all together, and you've just got something that is a head scratcher and disturbing. And it it was a disturbing. I mean, Brian, you played it. You did. You played it. You played it off. You you did that. You did your part. But mm-hmm. having the satellite feed crash after that, and listening to Art's panic, you take all of that in its totality, and it was magic, and it was yeah. great. And there's a reason why millions of people listen to that. The, the the replay of that on YouTube all the time. It's yeah, a- the, the, as Mike was saying, the people that fixate on my call as to whether or not it was real and have their hopes or dreams uh, raised or dashed by by whatever I'm I'm revealing as like, hey, I was the guy that night. Oh, Art, hello. Oh. Uh, that's <laughs> Mike. Said, that's not the point. I I was not under the employ. I mean, I I was literally living in my parents' basement. I was not under the employ of Coast to Coast. Art had no influence over a satellite. I remember hearing the very next day on CNN they reported quote one like one of the bird like uh, one uh, I knew a woman who worked for GE. And when all this went down, she phrased it as one of our birds went down. And it was news on CNN the next day that, a, that a, uh, one of their satellites had lost Earthlock. And then Art Bell, that night on the radio, the night following, he reported it. And so when, when I look at it all, I know that what I was bringing was a comic book backstory that I had formulated with Mike. And I, I, I lucked into getting on the air. I got into the slot. Art picked up the phone. I know that Art, there was no, he, he, I mean, to this day, he has no way of knowing, like, oh, this Brian Glass guy keeps claiming he's the Area 51 <laughs> caller. He has no proof. And did, didn't you try to, this is the thing, too, didn't you try to clear the air didn't you just try to say hey hey it was me you know i'm sorry i didn't mean to cause all of this i mean did you try to go there what what i can say is i i reached out to art via email and art used to do a thing where before he would go on the air like 10 minutes before he would begin taking calls 
And he spoke to me several times, but I understood going into all of those conversations, Art doesn't know who the guy is on the other end of the phone. He was never going to communicate with me as if, okay, you're the guy, I understand, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. He, he was a professional, and none of that ever took place. And I would talk to him, and, and like deep down in, in my gut, I, like, I, I'm one of these guys that like, I simply want someone who doesn't believe me to believe me. <laughs> And so a lot of my communication with art was based on that premise. And at the time, I knew I was also pretty desperate for my career to take off. And so all these elements were coming into play. So if, if you end up, when you go back and you listen to those Art Bell archives, to when Brian confesses he's the Area 51 caller, listen to the voice. It's the same guy you've been hearing all night long. But the, the trepidation that you hear in that communication was, I wasn't sure how Art was going to respond, because Art was not convinced I was the guy. There was no way in the world I could convince him. And so he had his integrity to stand by. And so you end up getting, like, you hear that call, and... When I did the original Area 51 caller, there's the act of the uh, uh, art. I'm, uh, and then when you hear me call back again, those same elements that I drew upon as an actor were in me out of my normal human interaction. And I had no idea. Was, was I pissing art off? Was I bothering him? Was he going to encourage me or was he going to dismiss me and you hear all that in my voice as I'm trying to relay and in the end all I could do was I can replicate I can replicate what I did the first time and then when you look at comments there's the people that go oh yeah absolutely it was that guy and it was all a fake and then the people that go oh I don't believe it I think the first guy was killed and this is an actor they hired and that's when you enter the Ouroboros. There, there's no did way. You, um, did you ever think about what it may have done at Area 51? You know, could, could you imagine some of those people that worked at Area 51 getting off of their Janus flight and security just, you know, being at top notch, pull, jerking people off the, the flight, you know, wondering, is this the person that called his car bell, you know, <laughs> if it messed with their day-to-day -day operations? Oh, there. oh that's I, a great question, actually. Yeah, I, ab absolutely. I've actually had a, a close friend, Drew Gaska, kind of confront me with the same, like, when does your act kind of conflict with the reality of what transpired afterwards? And in 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 retrospect, all that I can say is, I made the call from a mentality of, I want to be part of our show. I want to be part of the theater. And that if I'm calling as part of Area 51 night, nothing I say is going to be like taken beyond the confines of the show. But then something outside of me, something outside of art, interacted on the show this satellite outage right. and that coincidence that is the conspiracy that is so incredible i never intended any disrespect whatsoever to area 51 employees to people that believe in various aspects of ufology that night i believed i was part of show business and then all of a sudden show business went terribly awry. Do you feel and bad? Do you, I'm, I'm watching Twitter right now, Brian. Do you, mm -hmm. feel, do you feel bad about it later? It was out of your control. You couldn't control the satellite going down, which you know took this thing to a whole nother level. As a matter of fact, if the satellite hadn't gone down, nobody would have ever listened to that call ever again. Okay, it's, let's... Exactly. You know... As, 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 as I, I relate mean, earlier, there was a whole... The theater of the event actually even had an ending. 
that the the Area 51 caller would shriek, oh no, they found me, and boxes fell, and a glass shattered, and there would be moments of silence, and then a man would pick up the phone and go, what you have just heard, <laughs> Mr. Bell, it was entertainment for your audience. But the die had already been cast. Right. Something outside of me changed that dynamic. And like, yeah, people people can hate me, well, but it's an absurd hate. Uh, people can well, love I the theater of the it, and, and thank yeah. you for that. <laughs> uh, what was that, Steve? They just need to pull their big boy pants up. You know, you can't take offense to that. If, you know, you got to let stuff like that roll off. If, uh, you know, yeah. If you can't take a joke, you know. Well, well yeah. even beyond the joke, the point is, at some point, I said something in a... I relayed information in a comic book backstory that made a satellite go down. <laughs> so the, the mystique right. of it all doesn't live or die on whether or not I spoke truth. The mystique was that I said something. And for 17 years, if you want to say, do I feel guilty? I don't feel guilty for anything that I did. I created something. I was part of theater. It became part of history. But I said something that made something, me and Mike, we have different, we have competing uh, theories on this, but I, I have a theory that I call itchy trigger finger. And what itchy trigger finger is, is that there is some guy in the intelligence community whose job it is every day to listen to these programs, and he's got his finger on a button. And if he hears something that's somehow strikes a little too close to reality, all he has to do is hit the button and his bosses will clean it up later. And deep well, down... You're absolutely I, right. For us to think that the government is not listening to every one of these radio shows mm -hmm. and, and have the ability to cut us off at, at any given second is absurd. That They have to be ready for that. And they have mm. to expect the information that's coming through the radio show to, you know, to be a flashpoint and to be correct. And they've got to end it. No, that's yeah. exa that's exactly. If, look, the NSA. Uh, let's not let's not play around here. They're, they're recording every single phone call, every single phone call. Yes. Okay, let's not let's not. You know, let's not play around with this. You're absolutely right, Steve. There's, there's, and for that to happen to Art, and it's happened on this show too. And I'm not trying to say that this show is important. I'm just saying that they are listening. And if if anything goes out of bounds here, every single time, I, everybody who listens to this show knows if there's a, some type of critical mass, there's some peak. Something happens every single day. It's bizarre to me. Weird clicking, you know, <laughs> weird sounds, weird things going on. A computer will suddenly crash. You know, we'll lose Skype at, at a weird moment. And it's, it's, so it's, it's be really, really interesting. To, don't mind me interrupting for a sec. Um, is to have somebody go through your archives and just kind of mark down when this thing's happening. Because I bet it didn't happen at all when um, Graham Hancock was on or somebody who's not dealing with some of this, this sort of information. I bet the tendency for these radio glitches is oh, way lower. Oh, look, here, did you hear that? What was that? Right. And I, I think Jimmy made what was that, that before. You know, when he done sports, <laughs> uh, I heard it too. Yeah, that but was when weird. When he done sports, Jimmy, you never had an issue. Nope. Going off the air. Nope. Never had an issue. Never. 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 I never... I don't know if, well, you guys listen to the show all the time, so you know. But, uh, yeah, for years doing my sports show, computers never crashed, not once. Phone call interrupted, never happened. Video, nothing. Uploading, downloading, smooth sailing. You start this show, <laughs> I was warned. I was, I, I'm still warned. I was warned by multiple people in the, in, in, in ufology 
um, off the air. Okay, Jimmy, you just got to be ready. It's going to happen. You're going to get messed with. You think we're joking. You watch. And I was like, ah, nah, come on. And it was just, it was, it's, it's funny to me now. It, 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 I, I used to get frustrated. Uh, we had a, we were at critical mass a couple of months ago and, uh, and the computers crashed and I said some foul words on the air and I felt, felt bad about that. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's bizarre to me that, that it happens, but you know, you gotta, it's, 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 uh, it just comes with the territory. It, it really does. And I don't think it matters how big your show is or how small your show show is. Whether you're doing, you know, radio or you're doing blog talk or, you know, or just having some kind of chat, they're listening. They're paying attention yeah, to I'm, everything. They're monitoring everything, everything. Hey, Steve, thank you for calling, man. Dino's, Dino's coming up next. Have a good night. You too. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Steve is the best, man. Let's uh, let's go. Oh, I just hung up on everybody. <laughs> but I'm here. <laughs> Dino's here. Oh, uh, let me uh, let me get everybody back. I can't believe I just did that. It's part of the conspiracy. Oh, I'm it's so mind control. It's. Uh, I hope they're listening. Uh, let's just uh, let me bring everybody back here. Um, yeah, I just, MK Ultra. I can't believe I just did that. Uh, so anyway, uh, let me see here. Let me go to my list. Hey, hey guys, just call me right back. Call me right back. Uh, we're at the end of the show here too. Oh, how embarrassing. It's, it's so funny. It's, it's just so funny. It's just one mouse click. It's like a quarter of an inch. And if you just make the mistake, everything goes down. So, um, Dino, how are you tonight? Oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. How are you? Uh, I'm doing good. Okay, here we go. We got Michael back. Michael, are you with us? Yes, sir. Oh, man. Dino just dropped. Now, see, now, that right there, there that is bizarre. <laughs> that is bizarre. Dino, call us right back. That was weird. I, I, yeah, I, I, I was cut off not for my end. My phone kept going, but it was just completely uh, silent, so I decided I should call back. <laughs> um, so it wasn't, it wasn't for my end. Oh, man. And uh, yeah, Brian's in the clear. Brian never left. So yes, I have because you guys called me. <laughs> <laughs> well, because they in quotes knew that um, Brian had a theory of a sticky trigger figure, so that would just uh, um, you know qualify what he was saying earlier. So they didn't want to cut him off. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, you know, and uh, one of the points I want to make clear while I'm waiting uh, for Dino to join us again is um uh and, and no show is complete without Dino by the way you guys know that and uh it's it's, mm. it's great to get, uh, bring him on with you too but yeah. the point that I want to make very clear and Brian I'm um I'm in no way being demeaning here but if if the satellites hadn't gone down you would have been just another caller and that's what I expected that night yeah that's it that's just it. another caller Everybody is so angry with you. Um, you know, I'm watching. Uh, I'm watching Twitter tonight. Okay, now uh, I'm going to bring in Dino correctly. Here we go. You ready? No mistakes. Hey, Dino. Okay, welcome back. Okay. okay. Uh, the point that uh, you know needs to be made here is the frustration that everybody has with you, Brian. In that phone call, is is the the domino effect that happened. After your phone call, the satellite's going down, um, Art's frustration, his, his, uh, I mean, I would have been just as freaked out as he was. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not in his brain, but I can only imagine what he was thinking. And he lives, you know, he's broadcasting out there right next to Area 51. And so he's dealing with all of that conspiracy stuff with Area 51 every single day. He helped expose Area 51 you know, NSA, CIA, any other three-letter government agency all knew about Art Bell and where he was broadcasting from. And that happens. It's the big, aha, see, I told you. And and so that's the frustration that everybody has is that you were part of this, Brian. You were just making a phone call. And and that's it. And uh, But it went down and it was indeed radio history. Dino, welcome to the program. What have you got for uh, Brian and uh, and Michael tonight? 
So you didn't hear any of what I had said? I got cut off right away? Yeah, you did. It was okay, the NSA, okay. man. It wasn't me. Okay. Well, I, I, associating with you, now I got all these alphabet agencies on my tail. <laughs> I already told you they wouldn't let me. They wouldn't let me go on jury duty a few months ago because of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right. What do you got, Dino? Well, it's it's a basically an extension of what you were just saying that uh, uh, for once in my life, uh, well, once in being associated with your show, I agree with Eugene. He's pretty acerbic, but. Uh, you know, I have to agree with them that most of us that are part of this community take this very seriously. And we're hoping that in the near future, if we do get full disclosure, that uh, it will be taken more seriously and it will be a world-changing event. So I don't want us to be a stodgy, you know, group. We should have a sense of humor. But I, I think a call like this is better for something like uh, April Fool's Day or, uh, you know, it's just... I'm glad that you got some career things out of it. I understand. I've had a couple of times in my life where you pull something and it goes right for you. But uh, just understand that a lot of us take this subject very seriously. And we're already, as Eugene says, on a thread where people think we're all whacked. So uh, we want to take this a little more seriously, and I think that's where a lot of the upset comes from. Well, and, and my and point it, is, and I'm going to let Brian comment in a second, but but my point is with bringing Brian on this show was also to set the record straight, okay? that That's what happened that night. Let's, you know, because uh, everybody goes and listens to, to that, that famous phone call all the time, and we just wanted to just set the record straight and show that him calling into this show tonight, we could do the same thing. You know, that's, that's all it was about. It was just that, that to set the record straight and to clear the air. And, and, and that's the point as frustrating as it is for everybody. But again, the, it was just to put it all on the table, explain how it happened uh, why it happened, where it happened, and all of that, and just put the facts out there. That's it. That's all, Dino. It's no big deal. Yeah, and, and for the record, I I thought, gee, is it April Fool's Day? Because as soon as he started talking, I recognized the voice because I've heard it. It's been on YouTube, you know. Right. And, uh, and you know, so to me it was just, oh, he's doing the, that show again. But some of the, the Twitterers and the sandbox were taking it seriously. Yep. And that's when, again, I just wanted to make the, the point. And then the Monty Python music, they should have realized then that it was a fake. <laughs> that, well, well, see, that was, that was the intention of the Monty Python music. Was just, you know, very quickly, I, I want to point out, when you're talking about taking this seriously, that the night that this was done, the open line nights, if you can go back to the 90s, remember Art Bell's open line nights on Fridays, a lot of times he would invite true theater. He was not, Brian was not injecting theater into the show. Remember, Art would say, like, you know, not only are you an Area 51 guy, but he would say, uh, if you've had experiences with fairies, call in tonight. If you are a fairy, call in tonight. Right. You know, um, Art, it, was, it was Art asking for anything. And he, he even said he didn't care if it was made up or not. He's not judging. It's just for their conversation. And so Art, Art not uh, that's right. That's, uh, uh, situation. That was the context. And let's make something very clear here. Art always said this show was entertainment. That's it. The show is entertainment. And he would now the the opposite of this show. Well, the show I hope is entertaining, but but uh you know, the thing is with art, he would say when when a guy when he would ask for a men in black caller, right? And he would get somebody to, he would he would try to see how long he could get this guy to keep <laughs> the story going. You know, that to the art was testing well, excuse him. Excuse me, excuse me though, but but even though Art said that, and even though Howard Stern says some things, people do take it seriously. There are people who live in the middle, God forbid, of you know South North Dakota in winter, and this is their only contact with the outside. And maybe they saw something in their life, whether it was Bigfoot or UFO or some dark shadow, or they had a Men in Black visit them. And even though it is entertainment, it really isn't. People take it seriously. It's, it's kind of a therapy group. Well, look at look at War of the Worlds, Dino. That's a perfect yeah, example. Yeah. Okay, well, the original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about that for a second. And 
did Orson when he planned that, and that was true theatrics. I mean, that was some choreographed artwork that he was doing back then. Um, but was he concerned with people taking it for real? Did he think that people were going to run out of their houses and start shooting at buildings? You know, did he? Did he? No, of course not. Maybe. But also, was the government involved with that, too, as well, as a test to see what the reaction would be in, in, in populace? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and there's always that question that is out there, too. So, yeah, yeah. And, and I have to agree, Orson Welles, was, okay. Orson Welles was a genius in doing that. But my father was alive then, and he said people were poking around the bushes with shotguns. It was a pretty serious thing, you know? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, uh, who was going to speak, Mark or Brian? Um, <laughs> Mark or Brian? <laughs> Michael or Brian? Yeah, I, I, I can jump in here. And uh, my, my end of it all is, I mean, if Mike did a really great job a moment ago in saying about how art was theater. It's like if, if you take, if you isolate the Area 51 caller, as all those YouTube videos do, like, oh, my God, here's the guy that betrayed us. And it's like, oh, we're going we're gonna to crucify him. We're going to X, Y, and Z. He betrayed this, that, and the other thing that we take very seriously. And deep down, I'm a guy that looks at government conspiracy and goes, my God, I want the truth. Uh, but underneath it all was if you, if you take Art Bell's time traveler line, like, you, you, if you do a YouTube search, and, like, I want to hear the Art Bell shows where he did Time Traveler. And they're all, it, none of them are real time travelers. They are all people participating in the fun. He, he has done, uh, I heard, Men in Black line. Mm-hmm. That, that was referenced. Mm-hmm. And all the people calling in, you listen to them and go, wow, are they really Men in Black? And the only thing that sets my call apart is a thing that transpired outside of me, outside of art. I wanted to be part of the fun of the theater. There was no in, no intent. And w- when uh, the guy, uh, the the caller alluded to, uh, I've I've prospered from this. Uh, I'm the anonymous Area 51 caller. I receive no money from Tool, who used my call on the air. In no way has my being the Area 51 caller aided my career in 17 years until tonight. And you know, this is really cool to be able to be on a program affiliated with the same network where the, the original call was made 17 years ago, and at long last, tell my side of the story. This is what I set out to do. This well, is we're glad I, that we heard from you, but, you know, Joan Rivers, Robin Williams, you know, sometimes they work the edge of things, and that's fine, you know, and I'm not saying I don't care if you made money or not off of it. The point is, if we've heard your side of the story now, don't ever do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I have zero intention whatsoever of, like, I... I, I want to be known as someone who, who writes and creates fiction that moves people. At the end of the day, I want someone to have read something that I've done and gone, wow, this Brian J. L. Glass wrote something, whether it was Furious, whether it was My Templar, and whatever it was, it spoke to my soul and it resonated. And also, in, in defense like, of my friend here, remember, the end of his call was going to be him revealing that this was uh, a bit, that it was a skit. The end of the call was supposed to be Brian saying this was a piece of information or, or, or um, entertainment, entertainment for that, yeah. night, that night's line. So he was never going to try and fool people and, you know, let it go that way. Uh, that, that was not part Understood, of the Understood, but you um, see what, you see karma is a bitch because it got him back <laughs> and ever since finished. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, man. Well, like I said, we're just uh, clearing the air tonight, and and 
and having fun. You know, yeah. just explain it all, put it out there. Um, you know, I, I listened to the call last night knowing what we were going to do today. And, uh, you know, it's still last night. I listened to it again, knowing full well everything about it. And it still freaked me out, you know? So it was, it was, it was just radio history. There's a power behind it. Yep. Hey, guys. It's all of us. We're up against it. So I'm going to have to say good night. Thank you. I got to run. I got to, I got to roll credits and get music and get out of here. <laughs> So, wow, what a great show. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. I'll, I'll be in touch with both of you guys tomorrow. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Dino. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Good, night. Good night. All right. Now, that was a fun show. And everybody just quit being angry. You got to you got to understand. Okay? That's why we do this show. Education. That's why we do this show. All right. It was uh, it was awesome. Thank you. I the the intention for everything from the word go was to put the record straight. That's it. And if you're disappointed that it wasn't a real call, okay. All right. Are you disappointed that? It was not a real uh, that the, 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 you know the, the you found out the secret to the to the card trick and now you're disappointed whatever you get angry or, or or agree or whatever that's not the point the point is now you know that's all <laughs> and that's why you come here to have some fun these guys both Michael and and Brian are two of the most talented guys in comicdom. Their stuff is phenomenal. Okay, they grew up. They're men today, and and what they do is absolute. These guys are creative, creative, talented individuals, and that's that was what was behind the original call. What happened was an accident. The satellites going off of the air. Why they went off the air, we'll never know. We won't. We'll we'll never know. But that was had nothing to do with the original phone call. And it turned out to be, because of that, it was a genuine moment for everybody. Okay? For me, for you, for everybody else. Tonight, little recreation to show you it can happen. That's it. And this is Fade to Black, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Thank you for uh, <laughs> Eugene. Eugene, you know I love you, man. You know I do. This is Fade to Black. Woo! Brian J.L. Glass. Michael Oming. Dino! Thank you, everybody else that called in tonight. Stay tuned. Coming up next, Sky Watchers Radio with your host and friend, Angel the Jackal Espino. Special thanks to Keith Rowland and Art Bell. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. The announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Music is this guy, Doug Aldrich. Show intros performed by Space Boy. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Dark Matter Radio Network. I am your humble host, Jimmy Church. We will see you tomorrow night with another surprise. Be safe. See ya!